Hey there guys and welcome back to the Travis and Damien podcast episode 52. We are available on anchor.fm slash Travis Damien podcast along with Spotify, Apple Podcasts, Google Podcasts and many more. If you guys have any questions you would like to ask us, you can leave a voice message at the anchor link or a comment in the YouTube comment section. Today we're going to be talking about general gaming news like Twitch's new policies and Cyberpunk 2077. Then we're going to be discussing The Mandalorian Season 2. Lastly, we're going to talk about our best games of 2020. So, first quick bit of news is that Twitch has banned the word simp, incel, and virgin. So, <laughs> taking a quote from the IGN article, using terms like simp, incel, and virgin as an insult to negatively refer to another person's sexual activity is not allowed under this new policy. So, the new policy is supposed to take effect on January 22nd, uh, coming up to 2021. So, yeah, I mean, you know, things like simp, I mean, that's like a newer term that's been like a meme for a while. And, <laughs> yeah. like, it's actually like a uh, a sort of, like, normie term, I would say. Like, I, I feel like some normies, like, know what simp means. And it's, it's kind of scary, going to be honest. It's like, you know, when, like, memes first started becoming, like, mainstream or whatever. But, like, now it, it's just, like, part of pop culture. So, but in Virgin, like, if you get offended by those words, it's like... I mean, are you or are you not, bro? Like, <laughs> I was gonna say for incel, I feel like that's kind of like a your problem. <laughs> like, mm-hmm. you know what I mean? Like, yeah. Uh, simp. I don't know. I feel like simp is just a trendy word that probably would have went away anyway, like next year, because mm-hmm. you know, or maybe it could have stayed. I don't know. But I feel like Twitch is kind of making it worse by just saying like, "Hey, we're gonna ban it now," because now people like want to say it now. <laughs> so, um, like maybe I I can understand simp because it's like annoying, I guess, but. Like, in some virgin, I'm just like, whatever. <laughs> like, you yeah. can just deal with it, you know? Like, I never really saw that as a problem, honestly. Like, mm-hmm. I don't know what streamers are, like, complaining about, like, these words. <laughs> yeah, I don't know. It just seems really weird that they would just, like, ban these words for, like, no apparent real reason, I would say. Because simp, incel, and virgin, like, if you're offended by that, like I said, um... It's more of a you problem. Like, simp, simp is 100% not supposed to be taken seriously. If you take it seriously, then that's on you, in my opinion. Incel and virgin, um, you know, are you are are you not one of those terms? You know what I'm saying? Because, like, if you're an incel, then you're an incel. Then there's nothing wrong with being a virgin. Like, there's nothing wrong with that. So, but yeah, Twitch... Uh, They've been doing some really interesting things, I will say that, throughout this year in general and over the past couple of years that they've been doing some really weird stuff, so. Yeah, and it doesn't look good on them because they haven't been having, like, a good, like, month, (laughs) so Mm -hmm. uh, a lot of people don't think this is a good use of their resources, and I kind of agree. I feel like this is kind of low-priority stuff or things that should have been, like, I don't know, maybe dealt with earlier, uh, cause again, like simp, I felt like a rabbi like had its course, you know, like it's just mm-hmm. a meme word now people say simp for anything. So them yeah. just banning it outright. is just like, it just seems like a waste of time. I'm like, okay, I, but there's so many other things Twitch could like improve on, but it's just going to focus on this just seems a little weird to me. Yeah. Once again, Twitch just doing whatever the hell they want. So <laughs> <laughs> yeah, it's definitely not <laughs> making them look too good. Mm-hmm. Uh, but in brighter news, we got the Smash Brothers Ultimate Sephiroth Showcase. So this is where, of course, uh, Sakurai show off uh, Sephiroth's move set along with his stage. And uh, I had a few surprises, uh, one of them being the Sephiroth Challenge, being that uh, when the direct hat, or I guess the showcase happened uh, a few days ago, at the 17th, I think, mm-hmm. uh, you could play this mode where you could fight Sephiroth as sort of like a boss character, quote unquote. Uh, where it had like three difficulties and if you beat him you could play Sephiroth early along with the stage and so basically it means he came out on the 17th he was supposed to come out today I think mm-hmm. but you know that doesn't really matter because everyone has him at this point <laughs> um, and yeah I could say the character is really good uh, I haven't been that excited about the newer Smash characters recently I, I say the last one I was really hyped for was Banjo because you know uh, Terry you know uh, I haven't really played uh, uh, what was it uh, Fatal Fury, I think it was. Uh, sorry, I, I'm not. E- it it kind of shows I'm not too familiar <laughs> with what Terry is from. He's cool, but yeah. I'm not. I'm not mm-hmm. I wasn't that familiar. Uh, Byleth, you know, whatever. Uh, Min Min is also like whatever, and then Steve is like a meme. <laughs> so, um, <laughs> so Sephiroth is honestly like a really hype character for me. And um, after playing him like quite a bit, I I really enjoy him. He's uh, he feels very powerful. His moves do a lot of damage, and like 
he has a long range, as you could tell from his giant ass sword. But uh, he he is very slow, right? Like his mm -hmm. his moves come out really slowly. Uh, I could see that being a huge detriment to him. And he's really light, apparently. He's like he's like as light as Jigglypuff or something. <laughs> like he's really mm -hmm. light. So having those two things isn't really a good combination. Being light and like basically having like a like a heavy character's move set. So I, I don't know how good he's going to be competitively. I think he might suck, honestly. But <laughs> he's super fun to play as. Um, I really like his one-wing mechanic. It's not too busted like Joker where, you know, you could just get Arsene, like, if you get your ass beat and, like, just win, you know? Mm -hmm. uh, with the one-wing, it's, like, it's a lot more... It takes a lot more into account, like, your stock count. You know, if you're in a stock disadvantage, then you get your wing earlier. Um, the percents seem, like, more reasonable. So, yeah, I think I think they did a good job. Uh, making Sephiroth and making them like sort of balance because <laughs> uh, mm -hmm. I felt like Joker they kind of they were kind of experimenting with this whole like well I guess Lucario started but you know what I mean mm -hmm. like Joker they were really like trying to have this uh, comeback mechanic and it seems like I think they got it right with Sephiroth it's not too obtrusive and when you get it it's pretty cool because you have super armor every time you do a smash attack but it doesn't seem that busted to me but again I'm not I'm not like a pro at smash so I don't know if I can say those things <laughs> but overall I, I really enjoy Sephiroth um I guess it goes to talk about like, like some of the other things he had. I didn't play the the spirit board because that came out today, and I haven't had a chance to actually try that out. But um, mm -hmm. basically, it, it kind of just feels like a like a redo of Cloud, since Cloud really didn't get a whole lot of love in Smash Four because you know Square was kind of being like dicks about it. So <laughs> um, now that Sakurai was able to get like they got a lot more music and some really good remixes as well for uh, like just songs you would expect to be in a f with Cloud like Bombing Mission or like the main theme of Final Fantasy 7 wasn't even there. So it's really good to see those actually in the game now and remixed too and they're really good. Uh, the the stage Sephiroth has is like amazing. It basically just spoils the whole end of the game for Final Fantasy VII, and it's it's just really good to look at. Um, it can be a little distracting, you know, because there's a lot of things happening in the background. But mm -hmm. uh, it's a very normal stage, it's just like a platform. Uh, it's just a, like a flat stage with two platforms. So, um, you know, that's pretty good for like competitive players. But uh, yeah, overall, I'm really happy with Sephiroth. Uh, probably one of my one of my uh favorite character so far from all the dlc honestly like i think i like joker as a character i just kind of stuck with him because he's more like he's like a quick boy and he's supposed to be like good at the game to use him i guess mm -hmm. uh stuff so has more like fun just like big sword and and uh what you call it projectiles and i like that so yeah overall i'm very happy with sephiroth yeah i was impressed with the showcase watching it live because yeah, Sakurai honestly made him really balanced. I guess he was watching uh, tournaments with the Joker and seeing it, how his mechanic of Arsent was being used. And he was like, ah, people are camping him, huh? Yeah. So uh, I guess we'll, uh, we'll have to tweak this mechanic if we ever bring it back, which they did with Sephiroth. So yeah, I was definitely impressed. I've seen our best friend Kofi play him, uh, you know, just on Discord. And he seemed like a fun character to sort of wield and move around with. Obviously, he's a new character. So seeing people just like not react to certain things or like not expect certain things to happen, that's always fun. Uh, but competitive wise, I think that the stage that he comes with might be competitively viable depending on how distracting the background is. But I know that for the most part, when people are playing on that stage, the later half of the, the stage that's like super distracting is like not even present, like when you're playing it. So right. it might replace Kalos. Who knows? Uh, it just depends on what the scene wants to do with him or with the stage itself. Uh, but with Sephiroth as a character, it's definitely going to be exciting to see if he does uh, sort of have a presence in, in a comp because I feel like MK Leo. Once he masters this character, he could be uh, pretty pretty dangerous because he is a sword character and he has a very similar mechanic, a, a very similar mechanic to Joker, which obviously he was uh, uh, probably the best Joker player ever, and he's also the best Smash Ultimate player. So, uh, but the other thing that they touched on was quickly on the me costumes with uh, some oh, yeah. Final <laughs> Fantasy characters and. Uh, <laughs> yeah. Rest in peace, Gino. I'm going to be honest, despite me wanting him in Smash Ultimate as a main character, when I saw him as the last fighter for the me costume, I was maniacally laughing. And Kofi was just sitting there, just like speechless, because <laughs> Sakurai did it again. He put the nail in the coffin for Gino, and I was just I was just laughing so much, because I was just like, man, they really, they really did him dirty twice. But yeah, <laughs> that's yeah, all I really have to say. Hey, look, I felt the same way when Bomberman <laughs> was an assist trophy, okay? I was really mm -hmm. depressed. 
So, like, Gino being dead, like, twice, because I think this is the same costume from Smash 4. It's just, like, yeah, he, he's dead, guys. He's, he's never coming, <laughs> unfortunately. But, yeah, that's just how it is, unfortunately. Mm -hmm. Yeah, definitely. Very funny, but uh, I'm sure I'm going to get maybe some hate from that. Please don't take it all that seriously. <laughs> yeah, it's like, our fault. <laughs> <laughs> hey, look, you know, Sakurai... He could have had Gino first. Instead, he was like, here's these Final Fantasy characters, then Mario RPG. And I was like, oh, uh, but, but, but wait, we're on me costumes then. Yeah, they did it to him again. Anyways, uh, let's talk about Cyberpunk 2077 because this has been very right. interesting. Um, so Damien could also talk about this because he's actually played the game. Uh, yeah, but as, from an outsider perspective, first thing is that Sony issued uh they pulled the game from the playstation store first off and then they were offering refunds to anyone who bought it digitally so if you wanted a refund you could get one um so when i first saw this news i was like that is kind of crazy because the fact that sony were able to uh even pull this off and like sort of was like all right like the game's so buggy and such a mess like we're gonna pull it off the store and even offer refunds to people that want it so and obviously the the uh, devs at uh what's their CD name project red. cd project red did they did come out with a statement on twitter uh pretty much saying that you know they they work closely with playstation all this other stuff if you need refunds here's the link to playstation.com slash cyberpunk 2077 refunds and i was like wow uh yeah i guess uh you know they really got scolded by Saudi. They were like, all right, fine, fine. You know, here's the refunds. But despite all that, the game still sold 13 million copies over that, which it's kind of crazy for a game that is this broken and this buggy. I know that people were really, really hyped and really, really excited for the game. I know people that were pretty much almost everyone that was following this game closely. They probably watched too much gameplay footage and when they finally got the game, they probably were able to look over all of the bugs to still enjoy the game for what it is, which like at the end of the day, like that's fine. But for me personally, as someone who wasn't exactly hyped for this game, wasn't really looking forward to it, I'll wait for them, them to like, you know, 100% sort of finish the game, if you will. So, yeah, and uh, that's totally fair. Um, and just, yeah, I, I mean, Sony pulling the game from the PlayStation Store, especially this close, like it's basically Christmas time, and mm -hmm. you know it's probably going to see a huge influx in sales during that time. Uh, it, it's a huge blow to CD Projekt Red for that to happen, and I, th I guess it kind of sets a, a precedent that Sony like won't maybe accept this anymore because mm -hmm. there's been a lot of broken games that have been released over the past few years, you know, like No Man's Sky and like Fallout 76. So that CD Projekt Red was the one to get their game taken down. I don't know. That says a lot because you know they're they're a big they're a big developer, and mm -hmm. Sony just brought it down just like that because they didn't want to deal with their shit anymore. It's just like okay, yeah. you you guys fix your game and then we will put it back in the store, which is which is totally fair. Like I think that is like totally in Sony's right to like sort of have that power over CD Projekt Red because again they released this game in such a broken state, uh, especially for consoles like. I personally haven't ha had any issues, fortunately, but I also don't want to be those people who are like, oh, like, oh, it's your fault for not playing on PC, or like, oh, I don't have any bugs, because that's dumb, right? Like, that's mm -hmm. a that's a really dumb argument that I always hear people say. I'm like, no, like, console players, you know, they were promised by CD Projekt Red that this game would work well on base consoles, and I think that, you know, console players on at least the base consoles probably expected a lesser experience than if they were playing on PC or on PS5 or Xbox Series X, mm -hmm. but you know, not not to this extent where it was just straight up broken. Like nothing <laughs> works. It looks like trash and like it, it, it like runs like garbage. Like it, I'm just surprised that they even thought that was okay to release at that state. They really should have just delayed the console versions or just straight up canceled the base uh, console versions is released a PS5 and Series X version cuz this really hurt their reputation like a lot like CD Projekt Red have accumulated a lot of goodwill from uh, Witcher 3 with you know oh here's these big DLC packs and free uh, other stuff and people love them <laughs> and that just all went downhill <laughs> and with like one game I've never seen such a dumpster fire or fire since uh, Fallout 76 honestly and even that game like people kind of expected that from Bethesda like but people didn't expect this from CD Projekt Red and 
yeah, it just shows you another lesson and like never really buy into the hype <laughs> for a game <laughs> like this. Um, and I'm not saying not be excited because I, I don't like mm-hmm. being super cynical like that. Like I, I love being excited for new games. Yeah. But never buy too much of the crap they sell you, right? Like never drink too much of that Kool Aid. Where it's like, oh, like this is like a whole interactive like cyberpunk world. Where you could do anything. It's basically like GTA 6 but in the future. Like no, 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 no. Like don't buy into that stuff. And mm-hmm. I think that was the best decision I made because I only saw the E3 trailers because you know I had to you know I was watching E3. Mm-hmm. Um, and that was enough to me. Oh, this game looks cool. I'll probably get it. Um, and that's about it. I didn't watch any of the other hype stuff where they were promising like the world and basically didn't deliver on any of it since um you know i, I already talked about it before where the game is like barely anything where you know what they showed off like or where it was promised to be mm-hmm. uh, i think the game is still good like i don't really regret spending money on it i'm having fun playing it but yeah it definitely isn't like this like genre changing game or anything like that and i think people are really gonna take this lesson to heart and really learn not to pre-order games or like not buy into the hype you know you usually we usually get this type of game like every few years like again like no man's sky or fallout 76 so this is just another lesson and i'm sure there's gonna be another game like this in the future that has the same exact effect and yeah you know people people don't learn but you you get used to it unfortunately <laughs> yeah definitely uh when I get like hyped or excited for a game, it's mainly because I'm making sure for myself personally that I'm not like watching everything that comes out for the game. Like for example, with Miles Morales Spider Man, like I was obviously excited for that game, really, really looking forward to it. I didn't watch everything that came out of it. Uh, when when Game Informer did like their whole coverage on it, obviously we covered it because we kind of had to. Um, but like outside of that, like I wasn't like going out of my way to like watch other people's videos on it. I wasn't going out of my way to like watch other gameplay. I was just sticking to what was officially released to us that it, that Insomniac was sort of advertising on their Twitter and wanted us to see. Um, and people who like probably dove super deep into Cyberpunk 2077 like gameplay and details and all of this other stuff. It sucks for them because they were looking forward to this game and now they got it and it's like, man, like what's going on? Like the game's just acting all weird and like there's random things happening and yeah, it, it sucks because you know console players they probably expected that this was going to be a lesser experience, like you said. And even then, like, I know that there's some PC players where, you know, maybe their PC wasn't strong enough to run it, or maybe they did have a strong enough PC, but the game just didn't run properly on their system or PC or whatever. Um, I know that uh, Cosmonaut uh, Marcus, like, he pretty much said that he, he uninstalled Cyberpunk from his PC because I guess it just wasn't working or he just didn't want to deal with all of the visual bugs and everything else that comes with this mess that is Cyberpunk 2077. So, yeah, but Sony putting their foot down, being like, all right, you third-party companies that's going to release this game along on our platform along with Xbox and PC, like... You guys got to make sure when this is a triple A title, y'all got to like, you know, make sure that this shit works is pretty much what they're saying, which is respectable. Uh, and they have the right to do that because this is their story, their platform. Um, and yeah, it, it is kind of crazy because Sony's losing out on money. CD Projekt Red's losing out on money for this uh, because I know a lot of people will still buy games digitally and this game is not available to purchase digitally anymore. You could still buy it physically in stores because they already shipped all of those copies. But yeah, Cyberpunk 2077 is definitely insane in terms of how much uh, chaos and sort of like how much controversy this game has caused after its release because I guess people expected it to actually be working after they delayed it like however many times that they did. So yeah it's been it's been crazy honestly Mm -hmm. all right so let's dive into our mandalorian spoiler talk so uh yeah we're gonna spoil everything when it comes to the mandalorian if you guys do not want to hear spoilers for the mandalorian uh please skip to our best games of 2020 list uh or if you already heard spoilers or just don't care you know keep listening to us talk casually about star wars because we're not that big of nuts on uh star wars i would say i i'd say i'm a a much newer fan i i think damien's a little bit more on the casual side but i'll let him speak on that um yeah i I mean i guess we're in spoiler mode now yeah yeah, yeah. i I mean not right now but uh, yeah i guess in terms of star wars uh i have always been like into you know obviously i grew up with the prequels we both did right like Mm -hmm. because that was like early where like 
early uh, i'm sorry late 90s to early 2000s is when the, mm-hmm. the prequels happened that's you know especially episode three i ate that shit up right yeah. i love episode mm-hmm. three uh, obviously now it's not great it's funny but it's still not really great yeah uh but yeah I, I definitely grew up more on that stuff and like the video games and whatever expanded universe stuff they they put it out um but after that like i didn't really watch clone wars and i, I knew a tidbits of lore but I wasn't, like, again, like, the biggest nut. But watching Mandalorian definitely made me want to watch Clone Wars and really delve deeper into sort of more of the, the interworkings of all these characters and stuff. Since mm-hmm. uh, Mandalorian Season 2 really, really is trying to connect things in an MCU uh, type of way. And mm-hmm. I think Disney even said it at this point. Like, they want to make, like, Star Wars into, like, an MCU format where things interconnect. And I think it's more important than ever to really get a more solid, uh, like, foundation of who these characters are. Um, but yeah, that, I guess that's my roundabout way of saying, um, yeah, I, I like Star Wars, but I'm not like the biggest fan. <laughs> so, yeah. yeah. I mean, my thing on Star Wars is that, you know, I watched the uh, Disney trilogy and I have my uh, gripes with that. The Last Jedi is the best one out of all of them. You can't. Uh, Man, that, that's some fighting words for a lot you of people. You can't. <laughs> yeah, that, that, that is some fighting words for some people because some people really do hate Ryan Johnson and what he did within that movie. But there's some people like myself that honestly really appreciate what he did in that movie. So, but uh, the one after that, The Rise of Skywalker, that one's hot trash. I'm going to be honest. Uh, but The Clone Wars. Uh, a uh, CGI show that is phenomenal. Obviously, there's a lot of filler because it is a anthology series. So some of the stories honestly don't really matter all that much, but a lot of them are interesting and fun to watch. Um, and then when it came to the Mandalorian stuff, uh, I obviously fell in love with that. And especially with season two, I think that uh, season two has some really good shining points. So now we're going to go into full spoiler mode. So general thoughts on season two what did you think about season two compared to season one and like as like a standalone season for the mandalorian damien uh i i really liked it i honestly think it was better than season one Mm -hmm. uh but i i do think like the beginning might have been a little slower than the mandalorian season one uh like I thought the first episode of season two was really good Mm -hmm. but i feel like the next two episodes were a little slower compared to the for season one uh, because you know season one you had like the whole arc of uh, finding baby yoda and doing all this stuff but then season one in the middle of it kind of like was a little slow and then it picked up at the end well i feel like this one is like a ramp up i guess mm-hmm. whereas like it starts a little slow and then it like really ramps up towards the end and i think i i like that format more than having the story arc in the beginning making it kind of mellow out in the middle then ramping it back up like in season one uh mm-hmm. I, I think i just prefer how this season uh worked out uh well, i don't know what, what did you think about it yeah, definitely season two had some really high points just because, you know, they brought in uh, Bo-Katan, Ahsoka, oh, yeah. <laughs> Luke Skywalker, you know, like all of all of these like Star Wars characters that people know from the Clone Wars and obviously just like Star Wars in general uh, it was very, very cool and very fascinating to see because with the Mandalorian season one, it felt very isolated from the other Star Wars stuff other than like baby yoda being there or gorgu yeah. or whatever the hell his name is you know like other than him like it felt very much like a western just like tv show it felt very isolated from the other star wars stuff but with season two they were like all right let's start like connecting shit and like that was like really cool to see and i think like you said with season two the pacing a little slow in the beginning you know episode one definitely brought a lot of people back into the mandalorian it, it was a very exciting episode uh and then uh you know still i wouldn't say filler but you know just like you know just like one-off episode sort of thing uh yeah. and then it got back into the whole you know like baby yoda stuff with ahsoka and bringing all of these other characters boba fett like that was super dope to see him in the show as well uh so yeah definitely season two might be a little bit of recency bias but definitely feels a lot better just because it just kept going like once we saw ahsoka it just kept going with like more stuff and like more exciting things that were happening so but season one is still like obviously like really really good because people wouldn't have watched season two if season one was bad you know so yeah uh yeah i definitely feel like the i guess the the you know like the side questy filler type episodes in this season felt less like filler like you know because they still were 
trying to do something. Like, even when, you know, Mando got stuck in the ice planet with all the spiders, like, he still got out to go to the planet where uh, Bo-Katan was. Mm -hmm. Uh, So, you know, it, it, like, flowed better. Because the filler episodes, I I don't really want to use filler, because, you know, I I still enjoy them. Mm -hmm. But, you know, I guess the the filler episodes in season one did feel a lot more disconnected than they did in this one. So, um, yeah, I just think season two flowed a lot better and was just a better experience overall. And, you know, I think, like, the budget just felt, like, way higher, too. Like, I felt like a lot of the... um, like a lot of the what do you call it like props and like just cg just looks a lot better mm-hmm. um so yeah i i really i just enjoyed it like the action was really good in this season as well there was a lot more action i felt but yeah, yeah i i general I, I thoughts i just i just loved it it was great <laughs> <laughs> yeah definitely and when we when we say like filler we just mean like episodes that don't like really mean to like the whole like uh main story of like trying to find baby yoda the jedi or like pretty much just like trying to get baby yoda back to where he was is what we're trying to say like those episodes that like don't really connect to that story mainly you know like we said with the ice planet you know it was mainly about uh mandalorian just trying to get off of that and trying to go to the next part to uh further find out who to give baby yoda to sort of thing but yeah the final episode i think that this one was uh definitely a huge talking point when it came out just because of the last part of it but I think leading up to this final episode, uh, how Baby Yoda got kidnapped and all of that stuff, I think really uh, gave a really good setup for this final episode. Pretty much setting everything up that we needed, along with all of the other characters having Boba Fett, uh, having or going back to go and recruit Bo Katan to be like, it's the kid. Like, literally every single time Mandalorian walked up, he was like, I need to save the kid. They were like, I bet, say less. Like, every yeah, single time. No and I, <laughs> every single time I was like, yep, that is that is all they need to hear. They're like, it's the kid. All right, let's go. Um, but yeah, definitely uh, before we get to the whole Luke Skywalker stuff, you know, like, what do you think about the overall episode? Uh, I, I liked it a lot. And again, just like him recruiting the, the, the people that were going to help him. It, it makes sense because uh, Bo-Katan like wanted to be there because uh, Goff, uh, whatever his name was, uh, Moff Gideon. Yeah, he had the dark mm-hmm. saber, right? And she really wanted that. So it, it makes sense for her to tag along. Like, obviously, like Baby Yoda and stuff. But, you know, she was really in it for that. So it makes sense because she's also like a Mandalorian, right? Like she, she has to have a deal there. So it makes sense for her to uh, come along with there. And uh, Boba Fett also has like, you know, some things he had to do, which, you know, that'll be later in the, <laughs> well, you know, with, uh, with whatever series he has coming up. But yeah, I, I like the setup of Raw. And then going into, you know, the to infiltrate the ship was just really good action overall. You know, having them split up. So um mando would handle like one of the dark troopers is really neat like you know having that one-on-one fight with it and like him almost like just dying from it like just one of them there's like a bunch of them too it really showed like how powerful those dark troopers were uh and obviously that would come into play a little later but you know like it took all his effort just to take that one thing down and it was just a really cool fight to see and then you know obviously um bo katan and everyone else like fighting all the stormtroopers was also always fun to see you know seeing all the stormtroopers die like always um and then, you know, the fight with uh, Mando and, uh, uh, oh, yeah, I keep forgetting. His Moff name. Gideon. <laughs> yeah, Moff Gideon. There you go. I keep wanting to say Goff Gideon. <laughs> um, <laughs> yeah, him fighting uh, uh, Mando was really neat with the with the Darksaber. It was, it was really cool to see. Um, and, yeah, I, I just thought it was a great episode with a lot of action. And, obviously, the, um, the last scene, uh, you know, I, I don't want to talk about Luke Skywalker yet, but just uh, – you know, Baby Yoda saying bye to Mando was honestly like a lot sadder than I thought it was gonna yeah. be. I was like, mm-hmm. damn, dude, like, why am I getting so many feelings for this? I'm like, damn, but mm-hmm. that was a lot sadder than I thought it was gonna be. But uh, I don't know, what, what were your thoughts on the whole episode? Uh, yeah, definitely, really, really good episode. Just like overall, I think that it was a really great finale, just because like it doesn't really like close everything off, despite no, like. Yeah. Despite Mando and Baby Yoda sort of separating, obviously that scene was, you know, like the reason why the show works so well is because of those two characters and their mm-hmm. relationship and sort of how they interact with one another. You know, like uh, when when Baby Yoda g- got kidnapped and then when Mando went to his destroyed ship and he saw the ball, I was like, God damn it, bro. Don't do this to me. You know, yeah. <laughs> like obviously like those two and their relationship. But now like we don't know where that's going to go because now Mando has the dark saber and how that's going to play into with him maybe versus Bo-Katan and how that's going to play because, you know, it's like a tradition within, I guess, uh, 
Mandalore. Yeah, Mandalore that like you have to defeat the person to get the, the dark saber. You can't just like concede it away, which I was just like, guys, who the fuck cares? You know, like just give I, it to her. But I actually thought that was pretty interesting because, you know, she was making fun of his like beliefs to like don't take off your helmet. But then she mm-hmm. has this stupid belief where like you have to beat someone to get the dark saber. Like no one would know. <laughs> like mm-hmm. you just give it to her. So I thought that was a pretty funny, like, you know, uh, ironic like twist there so yeah yeah definitely and yeah just like seeing those two split apart and yeah action really really good just like everything about the final episode was just great because it doesn't close everything off like i said uh but you know luke skywalker coming into the picture i thought that that was very interesting um i think that once i saw the x-wing and the black glove i was like okay like this has to be luke right like who the fuck could this be like can't be ahsoka who the fuck else drives a x-wing right so uh but yeah when i saw that uh the uh, cgi face luke i was kind of like oof yikes this doesn't look completely finished but what did you think <laughs> yeah i mean that that's always gonna be an issue like uh like you know uh it happened in rogue one also where they had like a, a dead actor and they just used like a cgi face and i think that looked a lot rougher than this luke honestly mm-hmm. this luke kind of just looked like a deep fake i think it's a deep fake i don't yeah. know if it's like mm-hmm. cgi yeah because it looks way more like a deep fake but um I, I thought it was fine i don't think they focus on him too much to really like i mean it's obviously still like yeah it's like weird <laughs> 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 like you know let's just be honest here it's, it is really weird but um i i thought it was all right like it didn't bother me that much like i'm like oh it's luke you know i didn't really think of it like oh what what the hell is that <laughs> <laughs> yeah um, some people thought that they should have uh, recasted maybe have sebastian stan as luke mm-hmm. there um which might have worked out i'm not entirely sure but you know mark hamill he's such a you know like he is luke skywalker at this point so like i guess like disney and like uh the people who are working on star wars are just like well we're gonna get luke skywalker back we might as well first ask mark hamill if he wants to do it and then they'll like you know cgi and do all of this crazy stuff so obviously he agreed to it and supposedly he, he kept this a secret and like no one leaked this for like over a year which is kind of crazy um so yeah like obviously seeing him there was very cool and he him being the one to sort of uh take goryu and sort of you know go back and train him and uh unfortunately you know yeah. i know what happens to the uh you know trained I jedi know. because of the yeah. uh, disney trilogy but uh we'll see what happens there because like and also like there's also like this other argument with like oh my god like john favreau like he did like luke better than like ryan johnson i well first off like ryan johnson's luke like this that is like way after luke's prime the luke we see in the mandalorian that john favreau had the pleasure of sort of like you know working with um this luke He's, like, in his prime right after Return of the Jedi. Like, my man's is literally, like, goaded. Like, he's probably, like, at his peak in his, like, Jedi career, if you could say that. Um, so, I'm not sure if they're going to continue using Luke. Um, if they want to sort of play to that sort of nostalgia, you know, Star Wars fandom, they could. Uh, but honestly, you know, I'm not sure exactly what they're going to do past Season 2 of Mandalorian, so... <laughs> uh, yeah i mean yeah like I, I i don't get people saying that either like this is obviously a very different luke like the luke from the sequel trilogy is like years like decades later like mm-hmm. this luke is like right after like blew up the death star so yeah of course he's gonna be like goaded like you say <laughs> like he, he's not, like I, I love the scene where he was just demolishing all those dark tubers because again yep. like i said earlier like it showed like mando had such a hard time with one of them he just took out a whole army of them and it, again it reminded me of rogue one where uh there was like the hallway scene where darth vader just like obliterating all the rebels it was basically like that but like the good guy version and it felt really good um and i don't know it just showed like the strength of how strong he is as like a, like a jedi i guess like oh look how strong luke is and this is pretty cool um and yeah i, I don't know I, I had no problem with luke's inclusion honestly uh r2d2 was cool to see too i guess <laughs> he yeah. just rolled off he's like hey what's up <laughs> <laughs> yeah definitely like i didn't have a, a, a problem with the uh, deep fake itself i just had a problem with like it looking like very jarring and kind yeah. of took me out of the scene when i was watching i was like god damn like they really like (laughs) like they couldn't spend like an extra like day trying to like polish this or something i guess you know they just had to like meet the deadline for whatever the case was but i was just like man i hope that they like patch it so like people in the (laughs) future i mean yeah because they patched one of the episodes uh where like there was like yeah yeah there was like a uh i forget which episode it was it was when they were uh, uh god damn it it was with uh it was episode uh chapter 12 
uh, episode oh. four of uh, season two, where there was like a a guy like in the background with jeans or whatever. Oh, like, okay, yeah, I know. Yeah, yeah. yeah, they like quickly patched that out, which I found to be hilarious because I didn't see that because it was already patched. But yeah, the fact that that was even like included there, and then fans are like, "Hey, yo, y'all see this guy with the jeans in the background or what?" <laughs> <He's> just chilling, <laughs> in turn. Yeah, uh, but you know, overall, I think that uh, what we have right now. Uh, is going to be very interesting for the future of Mandalorian because I know that the f- the plan right now is to have the Boba Fett series and then Mandalorian mm-hmm. season three or something like that. So I wonder on how that series is going to bridge over. I am like 100% certain that like the Boba Fett series isn't going to do as well as Mandalorian just because like Baby Yoda isn't in the picture anymore. Um, and by the way, like Baby Yoda's like inclusion within the show, like every single time he was on screen, like obviously like he like stole the show just cause like he's so cute and adorable. But like mm-hmm. when he's on screen, it's not just for like, you know, sort of like cuteness. Like he actually like, like there's a purpose for that scene where he's doing cute shit, you know? Um, but yeah, what'd you think about Baby Yoda? I guess. <laughs> uh, I think they, I, again, I think they did, I, I said this before. I think they did, they do Baby Yoda really well cause Again, he has some funny moments. So he's like, "Aha, la- laugh at the baby," and you know that's funny. <laughs> like, I mean, I-, I laugh at it, but it also shows like a connection. Like, you know, it's good at character development for both of them. Like, Mando really like caring about this, this like alien creature he has no relation <laughs> to, but he really cares about him because he's also t- like technically a foundling, I guess. So really, I guess he has a deeper connection to him because you know, Baby Yoda also has like no parents, I guess, and you know, <laughs> everyone died in the Jedi Academy or you know Jedi Temple, which is why he's like you know an orphan. Mm-hmm. Um, and I don't know. It, it just shows like the trust he has for this for for the, the you know the the baby Yoda Grogu uh, that he was able to like take off his helmet like not even thinking about it in the final scene where he just like yeah look at my face you know like he he doesn't care anymore because that's like mm-hmm. basically his child so I don't know I think they did a good job really um uh really giving character development and, and, and again it wasn't like he didn't feel like a character device or a plot device either like Grogu also had development as a character himself because you know when Ahsoka was saying oh he has like a, he's really scared he doesn't want to use his force powers but you know with Mando he feels way more comfortable uh and stuff so uh I don't really know what they're gonna do with him in terms of like the Jedi training like I, I highly doubt they're gonna kill him off in the um you know when uh what's his face uh what's his name fucking uh, <laughs> what was his name which one uh, kylo ren when kylo ren uh-huh. kills everyone in, in luke's jedi academy right like mm-hmm. i highly doubt like baby yoda is going to be involved in that i think he's going to like escape or something um because again gr- he's way too popular like killing him would be like just like like oh like you're gonna take all our money <laughs> like don't do that mm-hmm. so yeah um i highly doubt they're gonna kill baby yoda he's probably gonna be back in season three like i i i think he's gonna be back at the end of season three that, that's what i think because i think he's gonna have issues training him or something that, that's my predictions anyway yeah. Uh, by the way, I, I'm not sure if Kylo Ren killed everyone, but I'm. Oh, okay. I want to say that wa- like he destroyed the whole Jedi Academy. That Luke okay. Killed, I didn't though. watch. I didn't watch Last Jedi or uh, uh, Rise of Skywalker. I only know like certain plot beats of it. So yeah. Mm-hmm. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I just wanted to clarify that before you know someone came came after you or some shit. But, <laughs> yeah, yeah, um, yeah, yeah. Full disclosure, I didn't watch Last Jedi. Yeah, or, yeah, yeah. Uh, Rise of Skywalker. Um. But yeah, definitely, it's it's gonna be interesting to see the future of Star Wars TV on Disney Plus, just because, you know, Baby Yoda has been such like a key factor of it. But I'm sure John Favreau, like my man's got a plan. Like this guy, he is very smart in terms of what he wants to do with Mandalorian and like sort of with Star Wars in general. Um, I have full faith in him in terms of what's going to happen next. Uh, the Boba Fett series, I'm probably, I mean, we're we're probably both gonna watch just to see like yeah. what happens in that show. Um, but the last thing I want to talk about is sort of like the, the, like too much fan service sort of like remarks. So like, obviously within Mando season one, like, like I said, it was very not attached to the star Wars world, but still being a star Wars series. Like it felt like it didn't feel like star Wars in any way, but it was still like super good. Um, but Mandalorian season two, they obviously connect everything. You know, they have the Bo-Katan episode. They have the Boba Fett episode, Ahsoka episode, and that appearance with Luke at the end. Um, so, like, do you think that, like, they put too much fan service into season two? Or, or do you think that, like, they deserve to have that much in it just because season one really had pretty much none of it? Uh I felt most of it was dessert. Honestly, I feel like after like really looking back at it, I feel like Boba Fett was the most fan servicey character because mm-hmm. I feel like he didn't really have to be here to advance the plot that much. 
if if that makes any sense, like Bo-Katan makes sense because he had to find other Mandalorians to like find out what he's like trying to do here for for the child. Uh, mm-hmm. Ahsoka makes sense because you know he needed to find a Jedi, but Ahsoka was like, "Hey, I don't want to like actually like train this dude because I'm like not comfortable with that." I guess. And then yeah. Luke makes, <laughs> and then Luke makes sense because that's who Grogu was communicating with during like the uh, when it went to uh, that one planet. You know when he was like trying to search for a Jedi, I guess to like look for him. Mm-hmm. So I think all three of those characters make total sense, and I, I don't feel like they were forced in or like too fan servicey. I think they were really nice like treats for fans, obviously mm-hmm. you know uh, like as fan service, but um, they take they make total sense to be there uh boba fett felt, felt a little weirder like you know he, like he found his armor and i, I you know like he, i felt like they were leading up to it in season one and people kind of expected him to show up at some point but mm-hmm. i don't know i felt like he still felt a little like he was just there you know what i mean i don't know yeah I, I, that's how i felt about boba fett at least mm-hmm. i definitely somewhat agree on that i didn't think about that you know like in the grand yeah, scheme about, of things yeah, yeah yeah i didn't think about too much to like right now i'm like if he, he didn't feel like the most important like out of those three like other cameos i guess but mm-hmm. uh, it, it didn't bother me that much honestly I, it didn't bother me at all <laughs> like so, yeah <laughs> yeah if i had a guess it was more for them to set up this boba fett series that they wanted so yeah, yeah sort of just like connect it with mandalorian because mandalorian's the hot disney show right now so they were like well if we're gonna do a boba fett show we gotta you know insert them in here somehow so we'll just do it when like uh gorgu is trying to find you know luke or whatever so but yeah definitely i feel like that the fan service was deserved because you know they spent season one building up mandalorian in that relationship with gorgu or grogu i should say my bad it's I think it's actually, grogu, yeah. yeah it's grogu my bad um but yeah definitely that whole relationship they're just like building that up within season one and i've also building up Moff Gideon as like a villain who has been fantastic throughout both seasons. Yeah. Um, and yeah, I think that, you know, seeing Ahsoka, oh my God, seeing Ahsoka <laughs> for me as a Clone Wars fan was just awesome. I loved that episode, probably my favorite episode next to the last episode. Um, and, you know, seeing the deep fake CGI Luke, you know, I might have problems <laughs> with the actual effect of it, but, you know, seeing him there was definitely very cool and seeing that set piece with him slashing all of those uh, dark troopers was very dope but yeah overall mandalorian season two very 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 cool excited to see what john favreau and everyone else at that team sort of has planned for mando boba fett whoever they decide to work on next so yeah i just hope they don't stretch themselves out too thin Mm because uh you know with marvel we already know they had this lot of good directors and like people know the vision of the mcu Mm -hmm. uh we don't really have that yet for star wars so i really hope they find some good people to direct all these different shows and really tie them together like the mcu could or you know can so uh that's my only concern that they stretch themselves uh stress them stretch themselves out too thin Uh, (laughs) you know with uh, too many shows and like can't really balance it out too well uh, cause again, like I said, like star Wars hasn't proven that they could do that yet, but hopefully with Disney plus they could, uh, they could do that and make star Wars like really good. So yeah, I, I'm really looking forward to the future. Yeah. For, just uh, have, uh, just have John Favreau just like oversee everything to be honest. Cause yeah. he knows what yeah, he's yeah. doing. <laughs> Honestly. Yeah. He should have overseer like all the shows and like have like people he like knows can make something good, like, and put them in charge of like the individual shows, you know, cause I, obviously he can't do everything. So mm-hmm. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, definitely. Is there anything else you'd like to say about Mando or before we... Uh, no, that that's it about Mando. I think I'm good about Mandalorian. All right. So now we're going to talk about our best games of 2020. So the past couple of years we've done uh, this podcast or the two players podcast. We've done pretty much... We just had a list of games that either we both played or I played and Damien played and just like quickly talked about them. Uh, this year we're going to have some fun with it and we're going to do a tier list. So... Uh, you can't see the tier list unless you're watching the YouTube version over at youtube.com slash TV Sonic Gaming uh, and you look up episode 52 of the Travis and Damon podcast. Uh, but yeah, we're going to do a tier list uh, going from S to F, uh, S being the best, F being at the bottom. And there are some games here that I've played, Damien has played, we, we both played. So we're just going to go in alphabetical order and just talk about each game. Uh, I did try to play some of these games that Damien played because Damien does have a lot. But I just didn't have enough time because I'm working. And anyways, uh, first game, Animal Crossing New Horizon. So uh, let me hear your thoughts on this game because I, I, I've, been, I've been working on my video. So I, I pretty much know what I'm going to say. <laughs> okay. Um. So, Animal Crossing New Horizons is weird, right? Because uh, mm-hmm. 
I felt like at first I liked it more than New Leaf, but after playing it more and more, I felt like it's missing a lot of things that New Leaf had. Mm -hmm. uh, and I like I don't know like th there's no like the cafes and like a lot of things. I, I know it's not fair because you know obviously New Leaf is older, and the the amiibo like festival like update really helped the game. You know New Leaf had a lot more content once they added that. But I felt like I don't know like New Leaf. I felt like after a while just kind of got a bit stale. Mm -hmm. uh, a lot, a lot of the villagers like would just same the same things. Um, I felt like building is, is a cool concept, but like trying to build your your I almost said weapons. Don't no, try to build your tools <laughs> over and over again. Kind of got annoying. I wish it was like a portable crafting bench or something. That would have been nice. Mm -hmm. uh, but I don't know. I felt like like I, it kind of lost its luster more than New Leaf for me personally. Uh, like that's why I, I think I would put it at A. But I felt like I, I put like seventy hours into it. So I, I put a yeah, lot yeah, of time yeah. into it. Uh, but I felt like after a while, I, I don't know, I, I just felt like I kind of like don't care anymore. I haven't <laughs> done any of the holiday stuff besides Easter, yeah. which was like the first one that they came out with. Oh, yeah. Um, yeah. And I don't know. I, I, I think I want to give it B, honestly, just because I feel like uh, maybe with future updates. And I'm not just talking about like these seasonal updates. I'm talking about like like a real substantial update might make it a bit better into an A. But right now, it feels like it might be lacking a bit that New Leaf had over it. At least that's my opinion. I, I, what are your thoughts on New Horizons? Yeah, definitely. Uh, it's There's a lot of improvements that they made for yeah. New Horizons, like 100%. Like, there are a lot of good things that they did. Like, the Nook Mile system, I think that that is a fantastic thing that they added. Yeah. Uh, but for me personally, like, when I look back on my New Leaf uh, time, like, how much I had, let me just uh, look it up real quick because it was... It was a lot. All right. So for New Leaf, I legit had 197 hours on that game. That is my yeah. number one play time for my 3DS. And I've played it 251 times uh, thanks to the uh, uh, 3DS sort of like log thing. Uh, and then when I looked up New Horizons, I was very surprised that I had over 115 hours on this game, which is kind of crazy because uh, I, I felt like that I played less than that. Because there was just like not as much like new content and like new like interesting things to do. I think the first holiday event being Easter and they did that so badly with like the eggs and just like <laughs> yeah. how annoying that was. And like, yeah, I I just felt like that if it was any other sort of like event, like if it was like Thanksgiving or like uh, Christmas, I feel like that those events would have been a lot better because when I play New Leaf, uh, it came out in June of 2013. So when I played it, uh, you know, like the upcoming events were going to be summer themed, uh, fall themed, and then obviously Christmas. So those sort of holiday events were a lot more interesting. New Horizons came out earlier this year in March. So the first event was going to be Easter. And then it was just all about eggs and everyone hated it. Like, no, I, I don't think there's a single person that really liked the whole like egg hunting thing. Yeah. Um, and like... At a certain point, like you said, I kind of just like got bored with it. And since I got bored with it, you got bored with it. We all just like stopped playing it like collectively. So like we couldn't yeah. like, you know, play together again and like sort of like have fun with it, uh, which sucks because I felt like that if this game came out maybe a year after the Switch came out, this game, I probably would have had like over 200 hours on this game. And like, obviously there's people out there that are still playing this game every day still enjoying it you know they love the whole like customization aspect of the game with terraforming uh using the the qr codes to sort of get like new furniture pieces or outfits to wear and that's fun like i i had some fun doing that with my house like putting like melee portraits on my wall um and other things like that but like terraforming like i was just like not super into it like i just didn't want to like change the way my, my island looked because you know when you first pick the way your island looks that's just how i want it to be you know like messing with it i w i just wasn't a fan of that sort of thing in my opinion obviously but what are your thoughts on like terraforming and stuff <laughs> yeah okay i was gonna bring that up actually um yeah obviously i think the customization is a lot better like i think new leaf again i, I only play new i didn't play any of the other past animal crossing games i think the same, same, same. actually yeah i think the the 3ds was actually a really good system to introduce a lot of people to like a lot of newer series or older series i should say you know like fire emblem and animal crossing and all that um, but uh, I feel like you know New Leaf had the whole mayor system, and that brought a lot of customization. Where you could have like all these public works uh, and stuff, and that was really neat to like have what your town, you know, what your town was gonna have inside of it. And uh, New Leaf, I'm, I'm sorry, New Horizons really took that new direction where you could just terraform the whole island. I think that's really neat. 
but I feel like there was still wasn't enough substance to really make me care too much about it. Because mm-hmm. at a certain point, I had my island the way I wanted, and honestly, I didn't really want to mess with it that much. Like, I kind of like the layout uh, of the island. I'm not that creative to come up with like all these crazy like sort of like I see people make like uh, not jumping puzzles, but like, like these whole crazy maps, and like I don't know, I don't have enough time for that. Yeah. And uh, you know, if you're into that, you'll be super into that, and I could see you know how that would like suck a lot of your time and you want to make the perfect island but for me i just didn't end up caring too much about it Mm -hmm. um and yeah uh overall i felt like the customization is really good but everything else just felt a little lacking and i think that that could be solved if they have like some type of an expansion later on which they probably will because this game sold like crazy they'll be crazy (laughs) not to make more additional content besides the seasonal stuff Mm-hmm. So yeah, I'm really looking forward to the future of this game, but right now I'm kind of like done with it, which is not, you know, it's not a problem. I'm not saying the game is bad or like it has to suck all my time every single mm-hmm. day of the week, yeah. but uh, it definitely felt a little, a little lesser than New Leaf after playing it for a while. So yeah, that's just my opinion on that. Yeah, I was just very surprised. I still clocked in over a hundred hours on it when I was writing my script for the uh, top ten video for myself. I was like, I had over a hundred hours on this game. I didn't even know, but. We'll yeah, on. I mean, I, I had like seventy hours. That's like, that's like a lot of time. I and mean, I've yeah. I play a lot of long games on Switch, and I was surprised that game had uh, like, you know, it's almost like the same amount of time I had on like the Xenoblade games. So, yeah, <laughs> it's, it's a lot. <laughs> yeah. All right. So next game we got here is Astro's Playroom. I try to play this, but I'm just working too much. So what do you think about yeah. this? <laughs> so uh, I liked it a lot. Uh, I think it's one of the best. I, I say it's one of the top three tech. I, I don't want to say tech demo, but kind of is tech mm-hmm. demos that comes with a console. So obviously, like I think Wii Sports is probably number one just because of how popular and like how many people like play that game. Mm-hmm. You know, everyone where we like that the the Wii Sports was like the perfect game to bundle with the Wii. Show you exactly what I want to do. Uh, you know, just have a fun time with family members, motion control, that kind of works. You know, it did everything it was set out to do, and I, I think it did its job really well. And I think Astro's Playroom does a good job doing that with the PS5 in terms of the um, haptic feedback, because that was really the main point of this of this game. It wasn't really to show the graphical prowess of the PS5 or anything. It was to show off the haptic feedback, which is, like again, like the newest thing of, like I guess, hardware of the console. Mm-hmm. Uh, and I, I, again, I think it did a really good job with that. A lot of the power-ups you get in the game make use of the haptic feedback like for one with the frog suit uh it has a lot of resistance when you press down on the trigger and then you know when you finally press it down you know it, it was just a lot of pressure and then when you let go it felt good to let it go so you jump really high uh, other examples are is the bow and arrow again has a lot of resistance to the trigger until you let go of it uh the gatling gun which is also like one you get later i wish you used it more honestly but um you know when it, when you when you press down on the trigger you can feel it sort of like going up and down like like a gatling gun and it felt really good <laughs> Uh, and yeah, just a lot of the uh, I, I I don't want to say gimmicks because I mean it kind of is, but a lot of the <laughs> a lot of the tech they used was really impressive and it really makes you think of the future. For me, it got me thinking a lot of Ratchet and Clank and what they could do with all the different weapons. Since again, Ratchet and Clank has a bunch of crazy weapons, and with haptic feedback, you could give even more personality to those weapons. Um, so yeah, it really got me to the future. Again, the bow and arrow also thought me of uh, Horizon Zero, or I guess Horizon Forbidden West, where I'm like, oh, this is gonna feel great with all the different bows Aloy could use. So I think as a as like a pack in title, as a as a tech demo, it did a great job. And even as a game itself, as a platformer, I I thought it was like also pretty good. Obviously, it wasn't like that long. It was only like four hours, but it was also pretty decent. It has some cool little moments in there. Uh, and overall, I think I think it gets a B. You know, I think it gets. A is B. he going above Animal Crossing? Uh, uh, I think Animal Crossing goes. Yeah, there you go. <laughs> I don't <All> right. wanna... <laughs> Again, uh, it's it's a really. I know people are really saying like this is like the best platformer that like exists currently. I'm like I disagree with that uh, highly, but I think <laughs> it's, it's still really good. And I would love to see this uh, developer make like a full 3D platformer because I think they could do some really good things with uh what they showed off here. And I hope they're not just stuck with doing like tech demos because I know they also had a like a PSVR like sort of game also and I heard that one was a little more fleshed out so uh, yeah I'm, I hope they make like another like bigger 3D platformer at some point all right so next thing we got here is Call of Duty Warzone so this one's by me because I had to fill it out but anyways <laughs> Call of Duty Warzone when I was playing it uh with my brother and my friend James and my neighbor uh, actually um yeah warzone is just super duper fun i haven't played it in a while obviously so i'm not sure if i could put it in b but i would definitely put it in c it's not a bad game i think that 
uh, the whole like battle royale aspect of uh, you know shooting games has been sort of done over and over again since Fortnite came on the rise, uh, and and we've seen so many other battle royales you know try to crack at it, and some have made it like Apex, and some haven't like uh, what's what's that one Realm Royale or whatever with oh, the one yeah. with the chickens, yeah, like yeah. that one that one didn't even do well, but I think that Call of Duty Warzone. Uh, the reason why I like it so much as a uh, sort of BR game is because of the gulag, which gives yeah. you one more chance to sort of uh, win your 1v1 and then respawn, which obviously like respawning in Call of Duty is like a huge aspect of it. So you get one chance to do it. And when you respawn, you're back at square zero while everyone else is geared up. But obviously, I think that playing this game with a squad of two other people obviously makes it super duper fun uh i've won a couple of games not to brag but you know i've pretty much done jack shit when i won those games and like the circle was like in our favor or whatever um but yeah just like it's it's a call of duty battle royale like where can you go wrong with that not much and i think the gulag really does make this sort of battle royale stand out from the rest so that's okay. that's my stance on Warzone. it's a c but it's it's not all the way at the top of c um crash four so what do you think about this game in particular? Uh, all right. So I really, really like Crash 4, right? Like, mm-hmm. I, I like this game a lot more than I thought I would. Yeah. Uh, enough. I think I would give it an A, honestly. You would give um, it an A? I think, yeah. I think I would also give it an A. Now okay. explain your reasoning. Oh, well, now explain my reason. All right. So uh, I know people are like kind of shitting on it a little bit now just because it's like a real pain in the ass to get 100%. And I get yeah. that. Yeah. Because mm-hmm. the other, uh, and all the, like, I watched that Cataclysm episode where, you know, it was like, the horror is a game 100%, and I totally agree with that. You know, yeah. my goal was to get all the flashback tapes and maybe get all the gems, but after wasting so much time on, like, one flashback tape, and then wasting so much time to actually get the flashback tape in one of the other, uh, like, the harder levels, mm-hmm. I was like, this is not worth my time. <laughs> but for what's there as just a 3D platformer, it's fantastic. Like, uh, if, uh, who made this game? Freaking uh oh, who made it? Who it's made not like it? uh Toys for Bob. Toys for Bob, yeah. I think Toys for Bob did a really good job. They really knew how to make a crash game because they took mm-hmm. a lot of the elements from Crash Two, where it was mostly just running and jumping, and that's what I like. Just the corridor platforming with little fuss in between, like this. Not too many like animal riding. There's not too much like uh, other gimmicky things. Obviously, there's the different characters, but I personally liked all of them besides Cortex. I think Cortex was kind of lame, as we both agreed on when we uh, <laughs> talked about last time. But I thought yeah. Dingo Dial and Tana were both really fun to play as. I love the grappling hook with Tana and the uh, the vacuum like suck thing was also really fun as dingo dial um and so yeah and again all their platform uh, all their pl- gameplay relied on on platforming still it wasn't like too different from crash or coco and i thought again that's what i like in my platformers i want to just be jumping and, and running that's what i mm-hmm. like with different uh you know you know crazy obstacles and um uh, again i i think all the worlds were fantastic uh one the, the two highlights for me was sort of like the new orleans level was like a bunch of like music playing and like skulls everywhere and then the alien planet level that one was also really fun i think uh i forgot what it was called crash landers or something that mm-hmm. one was really cool too uh just overall i thought the platforming was super good you know crash controlled really well uh you know, the <laughs> controls are tight. <laughs> everything, everything about it was super good. Like, I just thought it was a really solid 3D platformer. Um, and yeah, I, I don't know. What, what are your thoughts about it? Yeah, I think that when I was playing Crash 4, I was like, man, I'm having such a good time. You know, like, this is such, like, like this is Crash 4. Like, there's, yeah. like, without a doubt that I can say, like, this is the true Crash Bandicoot 4. Um, definitely the whole 100% completion hell uh is there because 100 like when i was playing the game i was like man i'm gonna like try to hu- try to you know like 100 this game because like when i'm like enjoying a game i want to like 100 it so like i did that with spider-man i did that with miles morales and then with this game i was gonna do it and then i was like wait this game's getting really fucking hard like towards yeah. the end i was like jesus christ i've died like a hundred times on like this last level like i don't know if i could 100 this you know so um but yeah like they definitely had the I guess, like, idea of, like, making this, like, the hardest Crash game just because of how many collectibles there are, the difficulty, just, like, how much how much difficult this game is compared to the other games um, is kind of crazy. Uh, but overall, like, if you play this game on, like, the new mode without the lives and you're just, like, platforming, just, like, enjoying your time, you know, sort of taking that challenge and sort of taking your, your time with it, 
uh, learning from your past deaths, learning from your past runs. Uh, it's still like a super duper fun platform. And I think that uh, out of, you know, there's not a lot of other platformers that came out this year. Like this is definitely the best one. Um, and yeah, the other characters to play as Cortex is by far the worst because he just felt super stiff and really weird to control uh, yeah. compared to the other characters. But Dingo Dial, Tana, like they were fun to play as. The different masks that Coco and Crash get to use were all really, really fun and mm-hmm. really spiced up the gameplay and kept things interesting for certain levels. Um, and yeah, when you, especially towards the end of the game, when, when you're like switching between masks on the fly was very, very yeah. cool. Um, <laughs> I hated that part, but yeah, it was really yeah. cool, but I, I, I hated it. <laughs> yeah, it was definitely, definitely nerve wracking, but still like super duper fun. Um, and I definitely think that Crash 4 is definitely worth A. I could see why some people would put it S or even lower. I know that some people really do like, do not like this game, uh, for whatever reason. I guess that they just don't see it as Crash 4 in the same way that you and i do um but yeah i know that one of the uh yeti artists kevin k i forget how how his last name is spelled but he makes ant dude's thumbnails he like 100 yeah. percent in the game like three times over or some shit like oh that guy's kind of crazy but you know like he obviously loves crash so much that he did that um and you know when that's like the only game that you're playing he obviously got his 60 dollars worth so but you don't have to do that to get your, you know, money worth because this game is still like fantastic and really, really fun to any like platforming nut. Anyways. Yeah. And I, I think it's going to be a good, a good time for 3D platformers because, uh, you know, obviously Ratchet and Clank, Psychonauts 2 coming out next year, hopefully mm-hmm. Psychonauts 2. Um, and obviously <laughs> Crash and Sackboy this year. It's, it's looking good for 3D platformers, which is nice because they've been, as we know, been kind of absent over the past few years. So, yeah. Yeah. All right, so next game here is Cyberpunk 2077. Yeah. I don't know if you finished it, but if you want okay, to give so a quick, I, I, you know, thoughts. <laughs> all right, so yeah, full disclosure, I have not finished the game yet. Uh, I have like 30-something hours in it, and I've mostly been taking my time. Obviously, I'd love to do all my side stuff before I actually do the main story. Um, mm-hmm. But right now, again, take this as just a little grain of salt because I have not finished the game yet. Uh, I would put it at a C, but... This is also like an asterisk. I put this as a C mostly because of the bugs and all the other issues, right? Because mm-hmm. um, you know I had my fair share of bugs, not as not as bad as some other people, but but actually most recently, like before this podcast started, I had like this main story quest where it was this really dramatic scene, and the scene prior to it was like sort of like a flashback scene, and it was like like guitar like a guitar riff, right? Mm-hmm. So during this like really like we're well, not really dramatic, but like during this more serious moment, I just hear like this annoying ass guitar riff the whole time <laughs> the serious scene was playing that I had to um go to the menu and turn off the music just because it wouldn't stop. <laughs> it was really funny. You know, obviously I had like some tea posing um i had uh which got quests kind of break on me not too much thankfully but i had some quests that were being really buggy um and again all these issues you know all the the poor ai i'm sure you saw a bunch of the the meme videos which are just like you know uh cars would just like stop like you know there's mm-hmm. basically no ai in the cars the the cop like the police system is awful like a CD Projekt Red promised everything and just didn't basically deliver on anything. It basically feels like a far cry with a really good like uh, story. That's what it feels like. And you know, if those bugs were ironed out, I probably would give it a B. But as of right now, where it stands, I, I think it doesn't really deserve anything higher than a C. Uh, even if I was to give it like a like a like a grade, it'd probably be like a six or a seven at the moment. Uh, mm-hmm. I'm sure the game will be better in the future. And again, I am enjoying it. But I honestly don't think you could break an 8 out of 10, honestly, just because the core game itself has so many issues where the game is barely an RPG. Like, uh, saying this game is an RPG is saying, like, Ghost of Tsushima or, like, the new God of War is an RPG. Like, just because <laughs> it's, like, a skill tree and, like, some loot, like, doesn't make it an RPG. And I know some people might yell at me for that, but whatever. Like, like a lot of the things are just so superficial. Like, it just doesn't feel like an RPG. And this is someone who plays a lot of these things, so mm-hmm. I don't know. And, and, like, there's just not too many things you can really do, like to really like I, I guess replay value i'm trying to say like you can't really go back and like choose a different life path since those don't really mean anything after the first 30 minutes and the build diversity also doesn't seem as good like i just go guns and like that fe- feels efficient i feel like <laughs> uh, i hear other people try to go for stealth or hacking builds and it just feels so weak to just go to guns anyway so yeah it, the game clearly has a lot of issues that are like beyond bugs like the game is just fundamentally kind of like broken a bit 
So yeah, I think a C is kind of where it stands. And maybe when I finish it, it might be a B at some point. But <laughs> or or when the game gets fixed, I should say, uh, it might it could get a B. But uh, yeah, I think a C is kind of where it stands at the moment. Kind of a shame for people that were really looking forward to it. But if you have nothing better to do like I did and kind of just want to play something over the holidays, I think it's it's a, it's a pretty okay buy if you have it on PC and a good PC at that. Um, so yeah, it's uh, I think a C is where it should stand right now. All right, so next thing we got here is Dragon Ball Z Kakarot. This is my yeah. pick. Thanks to you for buying yeah. me this game. Uh, but yeah, Dragon Ball Z Kakarot. Uh, it's a action RPG in the Dragon Ball Z universe. So if you know that much, you know exactly what you're getting into. And it does it really well. Um, I'm going to give it a B, uh, but all the way at the bottom of B, because I can't really put it in C, because there's nothing really broken about the game. It's just that, you know, it's 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 a action RPG in Dragon Ball Z, and that's about it. So it's going to retell from the Sand Saga all the way up until the Boo Saga with Dragon Ball Z characters uh, with extra bits of story, which at first is a little interesting because you get to see like Raditz interact with uh, Vegeta and Nappa in like flashback sequences. But after that, like it, most of the extra bits of story are just filler, I'm going to be honest. Like, um, But I did like the part where you actually did get to drive a car yeah. with like Goku and Piccolo. I was like, I man, they, that, yeah. <laughs> they really kept that in. But like, you know, it, <laughs> if it's going to retell everything within Dragon Ball Z, they obviously kept it in. Um, the gameplay itself, it's like most action RPGs. You know, there's a attack button. There's a sort of spell attack, which is like the key blast things. Obviously, the sand transformations, uh, the leveling up, the items, like everything about a action RPG is here and accounted for. Um, and it, it's still fun. Like, I still had a good time playing this game, despite me, like, knowing exactly what's going to happen, you know, the gameplay getting a little repetitive just because, you know, I'm just doing the same thing over and over again, but, like, against a different enemy with, like, a different attack pattern, whatever. The game is still fun. I still had a good time with it. If you could find this game for, like, 20 to bucks, like, you should definitely, like, like pick it up and play it because it is a action RPG, so it will be kind of long, uh you're going through the entire story of dragon ball z so if you want a sort of refresh on what happens uh you can play this game and kind of have fun with it honestly you know when i was streaming it i was kind of paying attention but not really because i was just like i know what's gonna happen yeah. i know <laughs> i know you know oh shoot you know frieza does this thing you know but yeah i still had a good time with dragon ball z cat ride just because i'm a huge dragon ball fan and there's not much that they really did wrong with this game other than you know it it being a retelling of the Dragon Ball Z story. Honestly, I wish that they did Super. I think that that would have been a little bit more interesting. Say what you will about Dragon Ball Z Super or Dragon Ball Super, I should say. Uh, I think that having a game set within that anime as opposed to Dragon Ball Z, which has been out and loved and praised for however many years, you know, having a newer Dragon Ball story to take on in the games in like a full game and not just like dlc because i know that they're doing some like dlc bits for dragon ball z kakarot yeah uh for super but i feel like that they should have just like they should have just done super for this game but that's my opinion i'm gonna move on from there it's gonna go at the bottom of b once again next thing we got here is destroy all humans uh, I actually have this game, but I haven't played it once again. Oh, but shit. Well, like you know, the remake version? Of it? Yes, I have the yeah. remake. I bought that on Black Friday for like $20 wow. or something, but haven't been able to play it. So what do you think, Damien? <laughs> okay, so obviously I have a lot of nostalgia towards this. Uh, you know, I love Destroy Humans 1 and 2. Uh, played the crap out of them on the PS2, you know, along with Ratchet mm -hmm. Clank and Jack and Daxters and all that. Um, and, you know, my heart wants to give it an A, but it's realistically a B. And the reason why I would give it a B, and I, I wouldn't put it, I'll put below uh, below that. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, there you go. Um, because it's still a remake of Destroy Humans 1, where mm -hmm. its mission design is still very stuck in 2005 when the game came out. Um, you know, there's a lot of escorts, a lot of, like, just kind of janky mission objectives or just really basic stuff, like, oh, destroy everything where you're a saucer or, like, or kill this guy. You know, it's very basic stuff. And I think Destroy Humans 2 really fixes that. Like, Destroy Humans 2 is amazing, and I really hope they remake it with the same love that this remake have. Because I think all the problems the game has is not on the remake's fault. It's just it's based off the, you know, the original game, you know? Mm -hmm. They didn't really do much to really, like, do that. It's more like a... 
it's not like a like a full reimagining. It's just like a straight up remake with really pretty graphics and a lot of updated like control schemes. Um, and that's great. Like I think Crypto controls so well in this game. Like in the first Destroy Humans, he controlled like garbage. Like I, I actually went back to like sort of like try it again, like the original game, just to like compare it to this game. And yeah, it felt like trash. Like his jetpack felt like trash. You couldn't really strafe in the first game. I don't think you could strafe at all in the first game. I can't actually remember. But in this game, you can. Um, and his telekinesis felt really weird to use in the first game. It feels really good in this game to use. So yeah, I, I think like control wise, they make crypto so much better to control. Like in this game, you have like this like dash move where you could like sort of like sprint, which is really good to have because you know in the original games he was super slow. Like you couldn't like really run or anything. You had to like go into your uh, saucer to like really get anywhere. So um, I thought that was a really good addition they added to this. And uh, yeah, overall, I think they really fixed a lot of the control issues and made the gameplay like really fun, which is not something I could really say about the original one anymore because it feels pretty dated as a like sort of like a third person sort of like GTA type thing. It's really weird. It's a weird game. But um, I, I again, I think um, I, I don't I, Oh, THQ Nordic. Yeah, THQ Nordic did a really good job sort of like retooling what this character could do. And I'm really excited to see them either do a new game or a remake of two. Because, again, this has great potential. And it sold really well, too. And that probably is because of nostalgia. And, you know, it probably is. But uh, I, I still think it's a great remake. You know, I think it's up there with, like, Insane Trilogy and stuff to really show you, like, how, you like, this character could still work in, like, a modern setting. It's just, like, you know, the missing structure is a little whack just because it was, you know, it's based on 2005 stuff. So um, hopefully they remake two or make a new game because... Um, I am very much looking forward to a new Destroy Humans game because again I love this series. I think it died too soon because of uh, you know Tage Cube died. So um, mm -hmm. and uh, uh, Path of Fury kind of sucked <laughs> when that came out. But uh, yeah, uh, hopefully this will breathe new life into the series, and I definitely think it's worth playing. Just again, keep in mind it's going to feel a little dated uh, in terms of mission structure, but just excuse that because you know it's it's still like a 2005 game. So yeah. <laughs> yeah uh so next one is doom eternal once yeah, again which i also Damien. played <laughs> okay so this one's gonna be kind of hard i think i'm gonna put s honestly uh i think it's gonna be the first s tier uh doom eternal is really good i i love doom 2016 and i know mm -hmm. there's an argument there's actually a really big argument if this game is better than 2016 or 2016 is better than this game since this game actually changes a lot about the the gameplay like formula where in Doom 2016, you just kind of play it like a regular shooter. Like, you, just, you know, you just play it. It felt great. You know, there's, like, glory kills and stuff, and it was good. But I feel like this game goes balls off the wall crazy, and it feels more like I'm playing DMC than, like, uh, FPS, <laughs> where you have to switch between so much stuff to really get yourself going, and some people hate that. Um, like, for instance, you have to use the chainsaw to get armor. Or I'm not. I'm sorry, not to get armor, to get ammo from enemies, or else you just don't get any ammo. You have to use, like, the flamethrower to get armor from enemies. You have to use your freeze bomb to get health from enemies. And you just gotta, like, switch between so many different weapon types to counter whatever other mon or demon you're fighting. And I personally love that gameplay. I again, I felt like I'm playing, like, a first-person Bayonetta or DMC where you have to, like, really use Doom Guy's whole moveset to really get past any of these encounters. And this game could get really hard. Um, I actually played the DLC, the Ancient Gods or whatever. And that mm -hmm. game, like, that DLC really forces you to, like, use everything you know about the game like the the combat to its like full extent and i i really like it honestly i know people don't like the whole switching around and it just doesn't feel like an fps anymore and i could get that argument it kind of doesn't uh because you know aiming and stuff really doesn't matter uh it's more just like how you could combo yourself into all these crazy things and i personally think the gameplay is fantastic um the 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 combat arenas are super like fun you know there's a lot of different power-ups and, and stuff uh the upgrades are cool you know there's a lot of secrets like in the first game and that's great because the, the level design really feels like a metroidvania where you can like explore every nook and cranny and find like different like concept art or uh, or like cheat codes and stuff and i think that that was really neat to uh uh encourage exploration like the first game did which is one of my favorite parts about the first game and it just really extended that into this game, plus making the combat better in my eyes. Uh, obviously, the game looks great. Uh, I actually played it on my on my crappy PC and was still able to run it. So I think um, it could, it could run on pretty much anything. I well, <laughs> if you have like a, I have like my old PC had like a 970, which was like really weak. I have a 270 now or a 2070 now. So like yeah, it's, mm -hmm. it's definitely. I tried it again with the DLC and yeah, it definitely runs a lot better. But um, yeah, overall, I think the game is fantastic. I know some people not might like eh, might not like the change of gameplay styles from 2016 to this game, but I personally loved it, and I think it's definitely going to be something that's uh, 
changes from person to person basically like if you if you like the more frantic gameplay of this game then you know obviously you'll like this but if you like the more slower pace of the of 2016 then you'll probably like that but for me i think it's a solid ass s tier i love it i love me my good like first person shooters with like a campaign because I, I feel like those are kind of missing nowadays so mm-hmm. but like a good campaign like just focus on story well not story but you know what i mean good single play <laughs> there you go it's great go play it <laughs> All right, so next one we got here is Evans Remains. This is a game I played uh, because I was just given a code to play it, uh, so I accepted it. Evans Remains is a mystery puzzle platformer, mystery thriller puzzle platformer with visual novel storytelling elements. Oh, so, yeah, that is a lot of genres to sort of mix in together, but they do it extremely well. And it's only a $7 indie game for about four to five hours maybe even longer depending on how long you try to get through the puzzles uh, i'm gonna put it in b tier just because i think that the game is really really, really solid for what it is um, the story itself the mystery thriller elements you're trying to find this boy named evan and as you continue playing the game as you continue solving puzzles you'll see more of the world and sort of what this mystery behind evan is Uh, And the puzzle platforming challenges themselves, none of them were sort of like mind blowing or like kept me stuck for too long, but they were a nice challenge to sort of break up the pace of the game to, uh, you know, keep me, you know, engaged with the game and not with, you know, the entire story only sort of thing, you know, Um, gameplay and story both worked really well. And I think that Evans Remains is a indie title that I think was slept on just because it sort of just released and no one really paid attention to it. Uh, but you know, for seven bucks, like, I feel like that people should give this a shot. Um, but yeah, if you're into puzzle platformers and if you're into mystery thriller sort of stories where, you know, as you're playing, you don't know exactly what's going to go on. The ending itself sort of like blew my mind. I was like, wait, what the fuck just happened? Like that was kind of crazy. Um, but yeah, Evans remains is definitely a very solid, uh, indie game. So fall guys, ultimate knockout. I think that this game took everyone by storm and sort of surprise everyone because when i first heard of it uh, uh, as like a platformer battle royale i was like oh okay like that's gonna be interesting and literally everyone wanted to play it. streamers regular you know i guess gamers or whatever wanted to play it um so yeah uh, i have an idea as to where i would put this where would you rank it uh if mm-hmm. you want to give your thoughts first and then letter grading yeah okay so uh, my thoughts are i probably think this is my favorite battle royale if you could say mm-hmm. that uh, you know, I, I liked Fortnite, but I felt like the building kind of got in the way, honestly, because I kind of just wanted to shoot guys. Mm-hmm. And, you know, that kind of sucked the fun out of it for me. Uh, Apex Legends only played a little bit of it. Uh, I didn't really like how it was only focused on, like, 3v3s, right? Like, I know they changed that now, mm-hmm. I think. But, you know, when I played it, it was only really like that. Obviously, like, Rum Royale was kind of, like, just bad. <laughs> but, um, so, yeah, I, I wasn't really too into uh, Battle Royales too much. And this game I actually put, a, a, like, a good amount of time in. I think I have, like, 27 hours in Fall Guys. Mm-hmm. And I, I thoroughly enjoyed everything I played. You know, I, I think the worst part about the game is the the lack of games if that makes sense you know like there's like after you played it for a few hours you kind of seen everything the game has to offer Mm -hmm. uh obviously the things that now with you know new updates and you know free updates and seasonal stuff uh but yeah i felt like that content you know is coming out pretty slow because you know there's no indie company you know like they they can't produce that much content that fast and i understand that obviously people are like keep ragging on it because like oh this should know or whatever like oh the debt game and i don't think that's fair because i think the game is super fun especially with friends obviously you know when we played it i had a ton of fun um you know it feels good to win you know when that um uh, what was it called like the the final tower like uh, fall tower or whatever uh fall mountain fall Fall mountain Mountain, yeah yeah. that felt good to win (laughs) You know, like, you know, obviously there's some games I hate. Like, I don't like tail tag or fall ball too much. But, yeah, you know, that that's just how it is. You know, if, if it, it basically feels like you're playing Mario Party that's more focused on, like, platforming, if that mm-hmm. makes sense. Or, like, Gang Beast also, where it's like, you know, you have, like, these weird physics-type controls. And I think it's, like, a super fun time. It's probably the best time I had playing a Battle Royale. Mm-hmm. Um, and I don't know. I think I'll probably give it B, but on the high end. Uh, I don't know. what what Where would you, like, put it? Yeah, I was thinking definitely A because I feel like that. A, yeah. This is definitely a solid battle royale for like you know a indie company to make. Uh, a platformer battle royale is something that I never thought that would come to light, and we got Fall Guys, and it has been really really good. I think that if this was done by a much bigger developer, they definitely would have had more seasonal stuff, more sort of game modes. Um, I feel like uh, Wall Guys, uh, which is one of the newer modes that they introduced last season for season two. 
uh, that one was like a really, really good game where you're trying to obviously climb the wall and there are these platforms that you have to move. But if you move them, other people could obviously climb that and get over the wall before you. Uh, so you kind of have to uh, first up platform well, but also platform well really fast to make sure that you're able to move these platforms without other people, you know, behind you and sort of like, you know, getting ahead of you because you're trying to help yourself, if you will. Um and yeah, I just had so much fun playing Fall Guys when I was trying to get the Sonic costume because I needed like eight crowns. So, you know, every single one I got, pop off moment guaranteed. It was so much fun. And even when I would like throw or like lose games because of like stupid stuff that would happen, whether it be in the first round, the final round, whatever, I still had a great time playing Fall Guys because it's a platformer battle royale and the controls are super simple. Kids could play it, adults could play it, like, and. Yeah, like just because the controls are simple, I feel like that it really broadens the audience of people who can play it. Because like with Fortnite, the reason why I stopped playing Fortnite was because the skill cap got way too high. Where like yeah. you literally have to like break your wrist to like sort of like compete at that game at like a super high level. Which like shout out to all of the Fortnite pros because I feel like that they are sort of playing in a game that is like no other where like you have to be good at shooting but you also have to be good at like this building aspect and sort of uh, managing your time as well to sort of get to the circle and all of that other stuff uh and then with fall guys it's like you just got to platform better bro like just jump better lol um and yeah <laughs> it's just super duper fun which is why i put it at a but definitely okay. at the bottom of a so okay i can agree with that i agree with that i'll say put it at a it is yeah good. Definitely at A because I feel like, you know, B, definitely higher end of B, but I think at the bottom of A is where it truly deserves because the game made a huge impact within the gaming community and sort of got overshadowed by a two-year-old game named Among Us. But, you know, <laughs> if uh, if Fall Guys had a bigger team, they definitely would have uh, sort of tackled that, you know, sort of hype and would have updated the game more. But it is what it is sort of thing. All right, so next up, we got another big game here, Final Fantasy VII Remake. Mm -hmm. um, and I'm going to say this right now. I'll put it at A. Um, it was really close to an S. I'll put it at the high end of A. Um, it was really, really close to S, but the ending. Mm -hmm. And uh, I'm sorry a lot of people could say, I don't think the ending was bad, but it's definitely worrying to see where this, <laughs> this is going to go in the future. <laughs> um, since, uh, honestly, this game is less of a remake and more of like a weird, like, reimagining or something like if mm -hmm. you're expecting a full-on remake and i know it's not really a spoiler it's more like just to prevent you from getting like too excited that it's gonna be like a full-on remake it's not like you know we already know this game ends at midgard it doesn't go anywhere you know towards the ending or even the middle of the game uh so yeah you're obviously going to know it's not gonna be a full-on remake just from that alone but after that it, it really is weird <laughs> after the end that's all i'm gonna say it's, it's really weird but besides that, I think the game did everything really, really well. Uh, I thought all the characters were, were perfect. I thought uh, they got all their personalities down. I love Barrett, Tifa, Aerith, uh, Cloud. Uh, a little bit of Red 13 at the end. Like I think all their voice actors... The, I, obviously, I played it like dubbed because it's like, defaulted as that. But um, mm -hmm. I thought all their voice actors were really good. And I'm still pissed that they didn't put uh, Cloud's English voice actor in Smash <laughs> at this point. Like I, I thought he was really good, uh, perfectly cast. Uh, I love Barrett's voice. I love Barrett in general. I love them in the original game. I love them in, in this remake. Tifa is great. Aerith is also really good. Um, you know, I, I think this is actually good to give Aerith more character also, since, uh, you know, we all know what happens to her um, towards the middle of the game. <laughs> so I think it's good to see her have more, like, time to interact with Cloud and the rest of the party. Um, the combat is fantastic. Uh, I know a lot of people compare it to Kingdom Hearts. I personally never play Kingdom Hearts, so I wouldn't know. But uh, judging from kingdom hearts where it's a lot more floating you could do a lot more acrobatic stuff this game feels a lot more grounded where you, you know you're constantly on the ground and you get to uh, pick commands you know just like how the old game worked where you have the atb gauge which is like an active time battle gauge which will fill up and then you could do an attack it sort of works like that in this game too but um you're constantly sort of like not auto attacking but you, you actually do attack with like the square button and that fills up your atb gauge and then with that gauge you could then do uh special commands so you could do like magic or whatever whatever else with like weapon abilities and i think that's a really good way to sort of bridge the gap between action combat and its original turn-based roots because it worked really well i was actually surprised at how much i really enjoyed the combat and unlike xenoblade where i feel like the party members are really dumb um <laughs> where they would just do stuff you can't really have control over because you could only play as one character at 
at a time. This game fixes that where you can just play as all of them at the same time where you can switch uh, with the D-pad on who you're controlling. And that made me feel so much more in control in fights and just makes a lot of the tougher encounters more manageable and just more fun in general. Since it made me think a lot more about what I want to do instead of relying on my dumb teammates that can't heal me or whatever. <laughs> as that happens a lot in Xenoblade. And I honestly hope Xenoblade will fix that issue uh, in, in future games where I could just switch to that party member so I could issue a command or just make demand uh issuing commands more direct like this game does as well um so yeah the combat is definitely a high point uh i think one of the lower points are definitely like sorry the side quests uh i kept saying it kind of reminds me of, like sonic 06 side quests where it's just like <laughs> like random npcs are like oh help me do this or whatever obviously it just kind of felt like padding most of the time Mm -hmm. Since um the game again is only at Midgard, which if you knew from the original game is only like the first like four hours, and they have to make that into like a forty hour RPG, so obviously there's gonna be a, a little bit of filler in there. Uh, some of it is good, but you know most of it is kind of forgettable as you would expect from JRPG side quests. You know not all of them are gonna be winners. But uh, I think a lot of the extra stuff they added in terms of the main story was pretty nice. Like, we got to learn a lot more of the Avalanche members, which are, you didn't really see them past Midgard because things happen. Um, so it's really nice to see them get more character and feel like actual characters. But I think Jessie in particular is, like, actually a really good character in this game. And I'm happy she got more expanded on because she, she wasn't really, a, like, a, any character in the, the original game. So, yeah, mm -hmm. uh, basically, I love all the new additions they added. The music is obviously fantastic i i love all the remixes in this game it's so good especially one of the boss themes are it's just so good <laughs> i love it so much um uh graphically i think the game looks fantastic but like i said before i think the character models look really good but like a lot of the like i guess like the backgrounds and stuff kind of look a little last gen and i think this game would benefit a lot from a sort of next gen upgrade hopefully it gets that i know it's coming to pc at some point so hopefully they could uh, fix a lot of the uh, graphical issues the game has. And, you know, it kind of runs a little, a little garbage. I'm not going to lie sometimes. <laughs> but uh, when you're in fights, it, it, it uh, what you call it, it, uh, it performs pretty well. So yeah, overall, really enjoyable experience. I think the ending was a little weird, which is why it's not S, because I'm kind of worried how that would go. <laughs> and it could be a bit janky. But overall, I think it was a fantastic game. I, I really loved it. And I'm really excited to see where this sort of like remake, trilogy or whatever they want to do with it will go from here so yeah i'm really looking forward to that all right so now we got ghost of tsushima so i'm gonna talk a little bit because you've been yeah. you know rambling so i'll give you yeah. a break uh ghost of tsushima sucker punch's latest game i was extremely excited for this one just because i'm a sucker punch productions fan boy i love infamous i love sly cooper uh so seeing what they could do with a feudal japan game that's open world once again and seeing everything that they showed us from the state of play for, to e3 stuff uh, i was really really looking forward to this game and i and i had no idea what to exactly expect despite me seeing everything that that they released all i knew was that it's an open world game with a samurai and i was like okay uh, i'm i'm in because it's sucker punch so and finally playing it thoroughly enjoyed it i think that the story uh I'm, in my opinion, it wasn't exactly all that amazing, but it definitely kept me engaged and kept the game moving. Uh, the main reason why this game is so good is because once the game opens up and you're able to freely explore anything you want, uh, the world does feel really big and really massive. Like the, the side objectives and the side activities in general, uh, they don't feel like, you know, filler and sort of like cluttered everywhere. Like it, they actually felt good to like, do in a way like the mm -hmm. fox shrines uh the sort of platforming shrines like uh everything that this game offers that isn't like the main story stuff or even like the uh, side mission stuff like you know the uh tales of, of tsushima or like the ones where you're uh, helping a side character do something um you know every other side activity actually felt fun to do and the world of Tsushima itself it being as big as it was and having so much stuff to do, it felt a little overwhelming, but still super duper fun to play through. And the gameplay itself, the differences between the samurai and ghost gameplay was super fun and super dope to experience because just like with uh, other sort of like, I guess, Souls-like games, uh, you can't just mash the attack button over and over again. You sort of have to adapt to the new gameplay style and the way that the game is functioning. Uh, so, you know, blocking and parrying and all that other stuff that comes with a Souls-like experience is kind of here and it's fun to do. It's 
it's really also interesting to see how the ghost gameplay works because that's all stealth and you're sort of in the e shadows and not going to your opponent one-on-one um and yeah and everything else about the game with the upgrades the skill trees and the presentation was a little shaky gonna be honest you know there were some bugs and glitches but i think graphically for what the game was for sucker punch productions i thought that the game looked fine and obviously they up the game for the playstation 5 i haven't played it on the ps5 yet uh but i'm um, supposedly the game does run a lot better on there so that is good but overall i am very very happy with ghost of tsushima uh so i'm not gonna reveal what i would put it at yet uh actually i am uh, i would put it at, at <laughs> i would put it at like uh definitely really high a or low c so or not c x my bad, say, my bad. Like, that's on. a complete opposite yeah so either um, low c or low s or high a so okay what do you think uh i mean this was like my number two game of the year so i'll probably say mm-hmm. it's an s tier for me um and yeah, basically everything you said, I agree with. Uh, one thing I'm actually really impressed by is just like the loading screens. Like this was. I oh was yeah, that too. A, <laughs> I was playing on a base PS4. Like I, I don't have a pro or anything, mm-hmm. and that it was just loading like three seconds. And it was actually impressive that Sucker Punch was able to really figure out how the PS4 worked at this point and really just like hammer it home. Like yeah, this is what it's capable of. Like this is like the swan song of the PS4. And mm-hmm. I think they did a good job. I think performance wise is pretty good too. Obviously there was some shaky moments like if it's raining the FPS would drop pretty bad or if there's a bunch of fire everywhere. But I feel for the most part it ran really solidly. Um obviously I love the combat. I mostly played as a samurai. Actually most of the time play as a samurai. <laughs> and I thought the combat was really fun. I know some people say it was a little basic or whatever or they wish it was a lock on. Uh, I th- I thought it was fine. Like I thought everything they did was like totally fine. Um, I love all the different like like sort of like dirty tricks you could do. Like I started like throw kunai's in people's faces. It was fun. <laughs> like, I love that. Uh, again, like you said, all the side objectives were really fun to do as well. Um, especially there's a side quest. Like most of them are like really sad at the end. Like oh man, yeah. like, everyone just dies. <laughs> and like mm-hmm. and it makes it really interesting. I do wish it was a little more happy endings or whatever. I guess that's how it is. Um. And yeah, and the story, I think, started off a little, like, not weak, but it was just, like, whatever. But I think towards the end, you really start to care a lot. Mostly towards the middle of the game, I'm like, oh, wow, it actually got really good. So, uh, yeah, I was really surprised by the narrative and where it, it took it from there. And I'm really excited to see a sequel that continues uh, uh, his journey, uh, Jin's journey throughout, you know, the Mongol invasion or whatever. <laughs> um, and yeah, uh, overall, fantastic game. Probably one of the best open world games i played uh, this year, I, I have to say. Mm-hmm. Yeah, definitely agree on that. Definitely the best open world game I played personally. Uh, there might be one other one we'll talk about later, but uh, I'll oh, yeah. talk for a bit because you got oh, yeah. the next two. All right, so Hades. So Hades is, well, like I guess, one of like, the, the superstar and indie game games or indie mm-hmm. game, yeah, indie games that came out this year. <laughs> so th- there was a lot of good roguelites this year. There was this, Splunky 2, and Risk of Rain 2. Uh, again, I, I can't really talk about Splunky 2 because I suck at it and I didn't play too much of it. And mm-hmm. um, and Risk of Rain 2, I didn't play too much of the 1.0 update. Uh, so yeah, I, I can't really feel too comfortable talking about that. But Hades is fantastic. Uh, I I think it's an S tier, honestly. Uh, probably one of the top three roguelites. Uh, you know, right next to Binding of Isaac and Gungeon for me. I think the gameplay is super solid. Again, it takes the isometric uh, sort of dungeon collie approach that Gungeon and uh, Isaac do, but sort mm-hmm. of like with more melee focus, which is great because I think those games don't really have that. They're more based off like bullet helly type gameplay. So I think Hades really uh, focuses on being more melee combat. Obviously, there's range, range weapons as well, but I think it's more up in your face. You know, you have dodges and all that. Um, and with every weapon, feels just so unique. Like I said before, the the sword is more of a balanced weapon. I love the shield. You could block everything. You could charge or throw your shield Captain America style. There's the bow and arrow. There's the 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 fist weapons, which are really fun. Where you have an upgrade that could like suck people up with like an uppercut and just like wail on them with combos. Um, you know, they did a good job really uh, making the weapons all feel super diverse, even better than any of the, the other alternate characters in Isaac or Gungeon, since they mostly feel basically the same. You just get different starting items. These weapons really feel like different play styles. And I think uh, Super Giant did a good job making that gameplay loop feel very satisfying. Um, where it falls apart a bit, though, is uh, sort of like you're playing, you're always playing through the same four 
or I guess five levels over and over again. Obviously, roguelites always do this, but usually there's alternate paths in them. So in Isaac, you go to the dark room or the chest. In Gungeon, you could go to uh, Bullet Hell or like some other areas, like the Rat Cave or whatever. And Hades is always like the same route, like all the time. And I felt mm-hmm. like it really could benefit it from maybe like a few different branching pathways, since there's a lot to go for in this game. Like, there's a lot of upgrades, a lot of things to to do, more dialogue. You could befriend different gods. And I did most of that. I, d- I definitely did the main story, obviously, which took me about 30 hours, which is like, you know, a, g- a great, a good amount of time for the game. But uh, I feel like without that sort of spice to the gameplay with those different routes, it kind of feels too samey for me to really care. Uh, and I think that's its biggest fault as a roguelite. I think as a game, it's fantastic, which is why it's as an S tier. Um, mm-hmm. But it's just as like basically an action RPG, it feels great. But as a roguelite, it feels a little lacking. Even in. Um, and itemization, like I feel like, yeah, the weapons feel good, but you could like all the the boons you can get from the gods like feel not samey but definitely predictable. Like I could make a good run from anything basically, and I guess that also lies in the problem where I think the game is a bit too easy, since a lot of the permanent upgrades you get are just like broken. Like basically, you could get three lives plus a fourth one if you have like a different item, like like sort of like an item you could get from an NPC, and you could just break the game that way. Obviously, you could play the game with harder difficulty modifiers. But um, I don't know. I, st- I think it still stands it, it being like one of the easiest roguelites I've played, which again isn't a knockout. It's just how it is, um, and, and it's kind of why it's not like number one in my roguelite list, like a lot of people are. I think it's like number three because of like it's missing those like critical features. I feel again, it has everything else going for it in terms of like story, art, gameplay. Like it's all really good. I think it's just missing that that little bit of what makes a roguelite really good and. Yeah, I think that's it's missing that. But overall, I think it's a fantastic game. Obviously, it's at S. It's probably like by my number three, my top three of my games I played this year. Yeah, definitely, definitely fantastic. And, you know, if you have a Switch, go play it. If you have a PC, go play it. I don't think it's on anything else right now for some reason. So uh, hopefully it goes on PS5 and Xbox Series X because I definitely think it's uh, a game worth playing, even if you're not really too into roguelites. Because, uh, again, like I said, it doesn't really even feel like one. So, yeah, I think uh, people will enjoy it. Um, uh, and next, uh, <laughs> uh, we got the Hyrule Warriors. All right, so Hyrule Warriors, Age of Calamity. Um, I think this is an A tier. I want to say it's an A tier. I think it's an A tier. <laughs> um, <laughs> every reason uh, I say at this. At the bottom or? Uh, yeah, I put it at the bottom. So I, I, why I put it at the bottom is because if you're playing this game for the story, don't. <laughs> um, I think it does a good job of sort of fleshing out uh, sort of the Breath of the Wild world, world I guess. Like, you know, mm-hmm. all the champions actually get a lot more screen time. I, I Like I said before, I think the voice acting is a lot better. But I think all the characters, like, feel, like, more comfortable with who they are. I think Zelda mm-hmm. still feels a little weird just because it feels like she's always crying. Like, I, 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 I read that complaint <laughs> a lot. Like, she always feels like she's on the verge of crying for some reason. I don't know why. But I feel like everyone else's voice acting is really good, actually. Um... I uh, almost said Link. No, Link doesn't talk. <laughs> <laughs> uh, Rivali was really good, honestly. I always like Rivali in the original game. I think he's really good in this game as well. Um, and yeah, uh, basically, I think it does a good job fleshing out things like the Giga Clan to give them more purpose in this game than they did in the original Breath of the Wild. You know, to go more into the, how the, the champions are, like, you know, how they are going to, like, confront Ganon and all that. Uh, but then it kind of falls apart towards the middle of the game. I, I kind of don't want to, like, go into it that much because, you know, it's still mm-hmm. really new. But yeah, they, if you're expecting what you're expecting from this game, just, just don't. <laughs> Story-wise, anyway. <laughs> just don't. It, it definitely is going to disappoint you. But gameplay-wise, I think it's the best Warriors game I have played so far. Uh, I definitely think the Warriors game has definitely been going up and up ever since I played Hyrule Warriors 1. And I thought that game was fantastic. That's what hooked me into this gameplay style uh, was that game. But I thought like Fire Emblem Warriors was better than that. I thought the uh, Giant, uh, it, um, sorry, the Giant Quest 1 was better than that one. And now this game is better than all of those. Um, and it just uh, refined the system so much. You know, the AI, you can command them wherever you want to go. You can switch to them on the flies. Because, yeah, the AI is pretty bad this game, you know, if you're not switching to them, you know, to take out enemy camps and stuff. But, you know, it's pretty mm-hmm. easy to just switch on them and move them where you want to go while you do other things. Um, you know, I think the combat feels really good. Uh, you could use the Sheikah Slate in really cool ways, just like in Breath of the Wild. And I think that's a really cool way how they add that sort of flavor of Breath of the Wild into this game, as they do with all Warrior games, you know, with their adapting it to a different, like, sort of, uh, what do you call it? Uh, I guess different genre. 
uh, I guess. Um, this was mm-hmm. like the different like spell rods you could use as well. You could use like fire, ice, and electricity. So there's a lot of like elemental weaknesses as well. Um, sort of the mission structure, I think it's a lot better. Uh, the game doesn't have a grading system anymore, so it feels a lot more relaxed just to complete missions and. It basically feels good to complete like nodes on the map, which is good because that's how it felt like in Breath of the Wild. And I think they captured that feeling well as a Warriors game. Uh, obviously, the performance isn't good. Uh, I think a lot of people already talked about this. Obviously, the game feels like it goes sub like 20 frames at points if there's like, <laughs> too much on the screen or if it's raining. And I, I attest to that. Yeah, the performance isn't good. But I feel like the game is still really pretty. And I feel like that's to a detriment where I'm like, oh, the game is a little too pretty where the game just can't run it. And I think that is because of they're using highly, uh, higher model, uh, I'm sorry, highly, higher poly models than they did in Hyrule Warriors 1. Because the Hyrule Warrior 1 models kind of look a little poopy compared to this game. <laughs> with this game, they felt like they just ripped them out from Breath of the Wild, which is great, but I obviously ends up with a performance cost. So, uh, but yeah, besides that, I think it's fantastic. Every character is like really fun to play as. Like Link is really fun. I love Impa. Impa is so fun to play as in this game. Uh, some of the other champions are really fun to play. Oh, uh, what's her face? The fish lady. She's super fun to play as. Uh, <laughs> Mifa, I think her name was. Yeah, she's super fun. Um, and yeah, there's just a lot to go for. I'm actually almost 100% in the game. I'm almost done with it. As there's a, a secret character at the end. So I really ah. want to really get it. Uh, and yeah, it's, it's just really good. If you're into... The warrior type games definitely get it. I don't know if this is going to convince anyone that's not a fan of warrior games to really like it. Um, but I think it's definitely worth it if you liked Breath of the Wild. Not for the story, because again, like I said, I, I think that kind of isn't great. But I feel like <laughs> just the feel of Breath of the Wild, you would definitely get it. I think it's a good holdover until uh, the sequel to Breath of the Wild, whenever that comes out. So yeah, definitely really good. Uh, definitely top tier Musou game. I love it. All right, so next one I got here is kind of a, a shit post. Going to be honest, uh, <laughs> Legends of Ruterra. So the, pretty much the, my only experience playing this game is when it was in beta. I didn't play it after it came out just because, um, yeah, I, I feel like that right riot like they had this idea of making like a legal edges like card game for like the longest time but like they kind of just like released it too late i'm not sure if like there were issues with like development or whatever but like they had some really great ideas going into legends of ruterra like all right so packs packs aren't a thing like you could literally you know get cards that you want and like the way you get cards is by playing the game and it really made it so like this idea of Legends of Runeterra was very much friendly to the player and rather than like with Hearthstone with like, you know, on how like that game played out where, you know, people were obviously like in the midst of like pretty much a digital trading card game where you would buy packs, you would uh, play, you know, with the new set or whatever, and you would have to pretty much spend money to get like the best deck. But with this game, they were very much adamant about like, you know, if you play the game, you'll get the cards that you want. You can build the deck you want, etc., etc. And I had fun, you know, one v one in Kofi, but like I, I don't know. It just felt like that this game kind of came out too late because when you look at the viewership for this game, it's super goddamn low on Twitch. It is like less than a thousand every single day, and like I feel like that Riot just didn't support this game properly. So um, the game itself, like it's fine. It's just that. You know, compared to like the other like recent Riot games, like they just did not support this game whatsoever. And right. you know, with like TFT, they like they they did like a whole like tournament with like streamers and like obviously like that game popped off because like it was doing well. But like with this game, it was a sinking ship and Riot just let it sink. So <laughs> just gonna put that in D casually. Damn. Um, I wish that it was better. I wish that. Uh, you know, I would have a reason to like play it and like have fun with it, but um, yeah, I just kind of threw that one in there. But anyways, I'm gonna let Damien talk again because Damien's got the next four to sort of <laughs> ramble on, so All I'll right. let him take the show. <laughs> Here we go. All right, so Ori, so Ori and the Willow the Wisp. Um, this one might be a little controversial. Uh, I mm-hmm. think it's like the highest end of B. I think it's like. Like, yeah, I think it overtakes uh, Animal Crossing. Mm-hmm. And I, I think the reason why it's not A, because it feels more like a remake of Ori 1 than anything. Uh, and that kind of was like, I kind of realized that when I was playing. I'm like, I felt like I did this before. And I kind of did, because a lot of the areas felt like they were from Ori 1, and they kind of were. Just like kind of remixed a bit. Well, not, that's not fair. That, they obviously were new level design, but um, a lot of the same tropes and stuff were like from Ori 1. At least I felt like it was. And 
I felt like a lot of people also felt that too. If, again, it felt more like a like a weird sequel remake where they wanted to remake a lot of the systems, and I think it works for the better. Like, there obviously there's now boss fights, and I think those boss uh, boss fights are really well made. Um, mm-hmm. The combat is a lot better since the combat in the first game was probably the weakest part of the game. It felt like it was just there to be there. Um, in this game, you actually have weapons. Like, for instance, there's like a giant like light hammer. There's like a sword. I think a bow and arrow as well. Uh, and it felt good. Honestly, the combat felt really good to uh, pull off. The um, the hammer was my favorite since the the hits were like really meaty and it, it just felt good to swing. Uh, all the upgrades felt really good. But again, a lot of the upgrades were from Ori One, like double jumping or that weird thing where Ori could sort of like hover in the sky and like kick a thing back to get more distance. Like all that stuff was from Ori One. It was really weird that you just didn't have them from the start since again this game is like a direct sequel to Ori One. So I was kind of expecting sort of like a banjo 2 situation where Ori would sort of know all these basic abilities you had in the first game and you get new new exciting ones. But a lot of them, like at least half of them, kind of felt like they were from Ori 1. Uh, so that was a little disappointing. It's kind of why it's at the higher end of B tier. I kind of wanted to give it A, but I think I think B, like high end of B, is kind of where it stands. Uh, obviously, the game looks fantastic, runs really well. I, I didn't have any issues. Uh, I know there was some, it was a little buggy at launch, but I was fortunate enough not to have them. Um... And yeah, uh, overall, it was really fun to clear the whole map. Uh, you know, there's a lot, ton of good upgrades and health pickups and all, all the things you would expect from a Metrovania. And as someone that's more new to this uh, genre of stuff, you know, I've never played too many Metrovanias, but been more open about them recently. I think Ori has still been one of the best ones I have played. Obviously, I have yet to play uh, Hollow Knight or even Metroid, honestly. I haven't played any Metroid in my life, and I probably should. But um, I think Ori is a great introduction. Since I don't think the game is too hard and uh i think it's just like the good amount of like ex- exploration and just goodness i, I love it. it it was really good but definitely <laughs> felt like it was retreading ground a bit too much in my opinion and this is gonna sound really ironic because i think persona 5 royal is an s tier <laughs> so yeah like, uh, we're an s tier uh all the way up baby <laughs> all the way up all right. yeah all right so <laughs> <laughs> all right, so not that this is gonna sound a little weird, but all right, I love Persona Five like a lot, and this is probably mm-hmm. the game of the year. I know, like, whatever. Mm-hmm. <laughs> but um, I think Royal <laughs> did a lot good. I, all right, the reason why, because I don't feel like yelling at me for this, but I think why Ori is at B and Persona Five Royal is at S is because Persona bleh, Persona Five Royal is still Persona Five, but like an enhanced edition. While mm-hmm. Ori is kind of like a sequel. Like, is it, it, it wants to be a sequel, right? It's not called, right. Like, Ori, Ori in the Blind Forest, like, remake, you know what I mean? Mm-hmm. Uh, so that's why I'm a little harsher to it than Persona 5 Royal, because, you know, that it, it knows it's, it's like a re-release, you know? Um, and, yeah, and obviously I think Persona 5 Royal did a lot good for this game. Like, it makes the original game look like trash, and the, the trash game was very, like, like a 10 out of 10. It was, like, an 11 out of 10. Because, uh, again, <laughs> it fixes a lot of the issues I had. Like, um, one of the biggest issues a lot of people had was Morgana, like, sort of, like, your sidekick in this game, telling you to go to sleep all the time. Uh, and that will waste a lot of days, and days are really precious in Persona, where you could use that to build social links with people or, you know, do whatever else you may have to do. Um, in this game, you have so much free time. In the base game, I was not able to max everyone's skill links. Like, I, would just, I just couldn't do it. In this game, I was able to do it with, like, plenty of time to spare, since they give you so much extra time thanks to the third semester ad at the sort of, like, the new end game content in this game. So yeah, you have plenty of time to max everyone's skill links and it are I'm sorry, uh, confidants in this game. Uh, and it it just like it just you have so much time to do things. Uh, I think the the revamp to guns feels really good as how the guns used to work was you would have like what like 12 ammo throughout a whole dungeon and dungeons are very long. Um, in, in Persona 5, but now they reset after every fight, so guns are actually useful to use. As uh, In the base game, I would never use guns. Like, they were just pointless, because you would run out so fast. Like, they did a lot of damage, but um, they just they, you just ran out. <laughs> like, you just couldn't use them. So yeah, I, I think that that was really greatly improved upon. Uh, there's more v- voice lines, I think. Uh, obviously, there's the whole extra semester with uh, Kasumi and stuff, and I won't get too much into that, because, you know, spoilers, but it's fantastic. I think it's a way better ending to the game than the base game, since the base game kind of ends how you expect any JRPG to end, um, as you would expect. Uh, I think the, the extra semester definitely adds some some more depth into the story, and I, and I really enjoyed it. Um, and yeah, obviously, the, it's still Persona 5. The combat's fantastic. Probably the best turn-based combat like ever as i know a lot of people don't, don't even like jrpgs love this game or just turn-based combat in general um it's just that good 
And yeah, I think it just cements his place in the top of S tier, and it's probably my game of the year, just because Persona 5 is fantastic. I love Persona, and Persona 5 is probably the best one. So yeah, that's that's all I would go into that, because <laughs> I, I already said everything I could about this game like three years ago, and I already said about it as I could, you know, when it came out. So yeah, I won't go too much more into that. Um, Pokemon Mystery Dungeon Rescue Team DX. This is also a weird one, because it's also a remake. And uh, I think I will also put it at B tier, and I will put it above Destroyer Humans, I think. Because oh, it yeah. kind of has the exact same issues I have with Destroyer Humans, where uh, obviously I have a ton of... I probably have way more nostalgia for this than like anything else, Like I guess, like uh, other remakes I have played, just because I have such vivid memories of playing like the demo of this game at like, Best Buy, buying it, playing it for the first time, watching the like that sort of anime short they had in like Cartoon Network. I was... I remember the launch of this game very, very well, and I, I had a lot of nostalgia playing this game. I'm not gonna lie, but I'm not gonna let that distract me from the point where the first Mystery Dungeon is it's pretty good, but it still isn't as good as like Explorers of Sky is. And uh, Explorers of Sky is just a better game, just like how Destroy Humans 2 is the better of the you know Destroy Humans 1 and 2. Um, and but I think what uh, not Game Freak. Oh, who made this? Uh, <laughs> I, forgot. I forgot the developer who makes the Mystery Dungeon games, but they did a good job really refining the the, the combat and just the, the systems in general. Uh, obviously, it, it might feel a little easier just because you know that's how Pokemon is nowadays. Usually, it's pretty easy. But I feel like everything's out of convenience. You know, obviously when you pull up your um, like your move list, it tells you if something is super effective or not. You know, things like that don't really bother me. I know that bothers a lot of people, but whatever. It's more out um sake of convenience than anything. Uh, they kind of refined a lot of the more tedious parts of the game. Uh, obviously, there's some filler like in the main story where it's just like whatever. But I feel like for the most part, it made everything feel a lot smoother. Uh, I love the art style. I think they did a good job sort of like giving it like a nice storybook feel to it. Uh, the music is great, and you know, obviously, it's, again, really nostalgic to me, and very, uh, really well done, uh, you know, remixes of all the music. Um, they also brought in some music from the, the newer games, too, which was actually pretty nice to see. Uh, obviously, I'm not a fan of the newer games as much. You know, I love Explorers of Sky or Explorers of Darkness and Time as well, uh, mm-hmm. but I think Gates of Affinity was garbage, and Super Mystery <laughs> Dungeon was okay. Uh, so, um, yeah, uh, I think this is a great thing for the Pokemon series because I felt like they were really missing on the spinoffs in Gen 7 uh, and Gen 6 as well, honestly. I think Gen 4 and 3 were the best in terms of spinoffs because this is when Pokemon Rangers, Mystery Dungeon, and all this other stuff ha- was happening. Um, so, yeah, it's really good to see uh, Game Freak really like, oh, people actually like these spinoffs instead of like our mobile game garbage. So let's let's do more of that. And I, I'm really happy because uh, also with Pokemon Snap is coming out as well. So again, I'm really hoping this is a resurgence of Pokemon spinoffs since this IP is just so open to so many cool things, and it's sad to see that they kind of regress into just mobile game territory. So um, yeah, basically just like Destroy Humans, it makes me more excited for the future of the series than the game itself. But I still had a really good time. It's still a fun nostalgia trip, and uh, I still really liked it a lot. And I think it uh, B tier is where it kind of deserves to be, since again the gameplay isn't as good as later installments, but I think its remake was really good. Um, Sackboy. So Sackboy, I think I'll put behind Crash. I think it's an A tier as well, since um, mm-hmm. basically I love it for a lot of the same reasons I like Crash as well, where you know I think the platforming was really solid. It's basically almost always platforming, but it is a little more gimmicky stuff in it, obviously, uh, since it's I think it's aimed a little more towards kids, but not too much more. Like it still like has like like you know stuff in it that well okay. yeah like the final bits of the game is still pretty pretty hard nowhere near as hard as crash because i was actually able to 100 percent sack boy unlike crash uh but yeah uh definitely um definitely has a lot of the same energy crash did where all the levels were super fun uh i think the this game actually used the crafting not craft you know what i mean like the what i'm trying to say the the stitch work and stuff like they used mm-hmm. that really aesthetic like thing that sack boy is actually supposed to do <laughs> you know what i mean like yeah. sort of like uh crafted world right like yoshi's crafted world but it really expanded upon it on this game since the other little big planet games kind of get lost in the sauce where it's like you know <laughs> it's more uh, community based levels so you don't really ever get that feeling like that's what little big planet was trying to go for in the first place so i think sack boy big adventure kind of really feels that aesthetic more um i think the power-ups are really fun um I forgot what it would call, but you have, like, these, like, Iron Man hover boots and, like, arms that are, like, super fun. Like, Sackboy can just fly like Iron Man and, like, shoot, like, plasma stuff. It felt super overpowered, but I love any level <laughs> that was in. Grappling Hook's always fun. Uh, oh, what was the other one? There was some other power-ups as well. Oh, like, there was, like, this boomerang thing that was really fun as well. 
And uh, I think all the levels really took advantage of everything Sackboy could do. And I'm actually proud of Sumo Digital uh, for, like, really taking Sackboy in this new direction because I feel like Little Bit of Planet 3 was kind of a disappointment to me. You know, I feel mm-hmm. like it didn't have the same amount of love and attention as Meteor Molecule did with Little Bit of Planet 1 and 2 since I love those games a lot. And I- I'm happy to just taking him in a new direction where they feel more comfortable at. And I, I think they just did a good job with, with this game. And I-, I hope it does well since I think... It kind of got uh, again. It got kind of got lost in the shuffle with uh, Miles and Dark Souls coming out for the PS5. But um, honestly, if you're a fan of 3D platformers, definitely give this game a shot. Um, you know, obviously it's not as fast paced as something like Crash. You know, it's a lot more slower. But if mm-hmm. you have friends, I think the online is actually up now. I think like it came out yesterday that you could finally play online with friends or just with randoms. I, I definitely think it would be a really fun online game as well, since uh, the game definitely promotes its more you know cooperative aspects more than like you know something like crash because you know it's a single player game uh, <laughs> you know it feels like 3d world that you're gonna hear that thing a lot where it's like oh this game is just mario 3d world and yeah it is but that's a good thing because i love 3d world and it has a lot of the same uh gameplay tropes and stuff from that game so yeah uh Sackboy big adventure really solid 3d platformer as well i don't think it's as good as crash but it's still it's still really good uh i still recommend it a ton of content as well it took me about 20 hours to do everything, which I, I think that's worth 60, honestly. I think a, a good 20-hour 2D platformer, I'll give it that. Like, you know, I'm like, mm-hmm. they, they deserve more money because I love it. <laughs> All right, so Spider-Man Miles Morales. Uh, so I don't think it's any secret to anyone. I love Spider-Man, and I think that this iteration of Miles Morales as a character was done expertly well by the folks at Insomniac Games. They took a lot of time. They took a lot of care and a lot of effort bringing Miles Morales into their universe of Spider-Man. And it definitely shows within the presentation aspect. I think that the hip hop inspired music is definitely very subtle and it is, it obviously works for Miles because he loves hip hop. And with this version of the character, he used to like make beats with his uncle and yeah, just like everything about this game. Like I just love it so much. Uh, The story itself. um, I think that some people might be a little harsh on it, but I think that the story really does show that Miles is coming into his own as Spider-Man. He finally, by the end of it, views himself as Spider-Man and and not just as, you know, Spider-Man number two sort of thing. And I really do love that. And you know, just like with Spider-Verse, they bring Miles into this world and he comes into his own pretty much. And uh, everything that happens within the story, the twists, the turns, the characters, um, I was super duper invested invested into it. Um, and say what you will about like the main like CEO guy, like uh, Simon... Guy. Yeah, yeah, the uh, Roxxon guy, I think his name's like Simon Krieger Simon or something. Krieger, yeah. yeah, Simon Krieger. Um, you know, he's he's the generic CEO asshole, whatever. But still, like, obviously the main focus is Miles and his growth and the people around him so, sort of uh, guiding him and showing him, you know, like he can be his own Spider-Man. And the gameplay itself, you know, once again, it is just like with Spider-Man 2018, but with the Miles Morales flair, with the... Uh, cloaking with the uh, venom powers like all of that stuff improves the game uh, in the stealth aspect and also the venom powers sort of make up for the lack of gadgets Mm -hmm. Um, so yeah just like the the stealth sections become a lot better because you're now able to actually reset the encounter instead of like oh shit I'm caught I guess I have to fight my way out of it which is what you had to do with uh, Peter Uh, But with this game and with Miles, you can reset the encounter depending on what enemies are around and you're able to camouflage and sort of hide and uh, rethink your approach if you happen to mess up, uh, which is very good. And the camouflage ability itself, it is like 10 to 15 seconds to like fully recharge the bar, uh, which isn't completely broken. But, you know, if you just sit around for a, a bit, it can be. Um, I still found it to be a really fun ability to use. And, you know, the combat is just like how it was within uh, Spider-Man 2018. And it is still fun as hell doing combos, doing uh, the finishers, all of like everything I loved about the Spider-Man 2018 game is here and then some. And the presentation on the PlayStation 5, my God, man, like the graphics look great. Performance mode, 60 frames per second. I cannot get over that on a console game to have 60 frames per second. And now that they implemented performance RT mode, which is uh, now you get the 60 frames per second with some ray tracing abilities, which is very, very cool. Um, That is awesome. And 
uh the load times man the load times are actually like so fast it is kind of crazy that we are able to sort of pretty much like literally when you're fast traveling it is actually worth fast traveling now because you instantly go to where you're trying to head to within like less than 10 seconds which is very very nice um and yeah i i i just love this game like 100 like this is my game of the year this is my number one game of the year so uh what do you think damien <laughs> um yeah i i definitely agree with everything you said i think miles morales like i think astronaut really improved everything they could from the original game you know again mm-hmm. with the venom powers felt really fun to use uh the cloaking really solved the stealth issue for me since i didn't really like the stealth too much in the original game because again mm-hmm. once you break out of stealth there was no way to really go back in so you kind of just had to deal with it anyway <laughs> uh, and i felt like the cloaking really added uh, a more layer into like the stealth gameplay and yeah, basically everything like you said. Like I loved, I, I really like the story personally. You know, I think yeah, uh, I think the story was really good. Uh, you know, it might it might seem a little basic to some people, but I don't know. I think it did a good job, really, like developing Miles' character more, which is kind of what the point of this game was to begin with, anyway. But I didn't mm-hmm. really expect it to be anything more than like developing Miles' character. And yeah, I think the game did a great job with that. Uh, obviously, the performance is fantastic. The game runs like a dream. I love it. Uh, load times are so fast. Again, like I said, I actually used quick uh, fast travel this time. Like I didn't mm-hmm. use it at all in the original game because it took too long. But yeah. this game is like instant. Like it's just like like just like it goes black and then you're back into the the, the game. So yeah, um, yeah, I also agree with it being S. I think it was it was a fantastic game. Um, and I, I, it just makes me really looking forward to uh, whatever Sony X is doing next for Spider Man Two because. I am very excited to play as Miles in a more like sort of like <laughs> fleshed out like adventure, like a really long one. So yeah, I am definitely looking forward to uh to whatever they're doing next with uh, Miles and just Peter in general. You know what I mean? Yeah, and uh, Spider Man Remastered, uh, just very quick here. Uh, if I had to put it somewhere on here, I would definitely put it in B, but all the way at the bottom, just because it's an older game, and you know the uh, remastered stuff that they did, uh, improving the textures, improving the shadow, the lighting, uh, the new Peter Parker model, like everything that Insomniac Games did, they didn't have to do. Like they honestly could have just like ported the game to the the PS5, bumped it up to 4K, gave us the 60 frames per second mode, then called it a day. But they literally went into to this remaster as an actual remaster they took their time they made sure that the game uh was going to look the best that it can be now that they have the hardware of the playstation 5 uh and the new peter parker model i know that there are still a lot of people that can't get over the new face me personally i am 100 sort of like over it like i i am comfortable with how peter's face looks and now that i have played the full game and experienced it seeing it in action in context with the other characters like aunt may mary jane uh and miles as well uh i'm very much used to it and very happy with how it looks and yeah the same emotional attachment that i had with the old face model like when i saw the the ending for the first time on the remaster i didn't sort of like tear up or like you know get like really emotional because i've seen the ending so many times that's just like (laughs) my fault personally because i've played the game so much but at the same time you know like when i experienced that ending for the first time not to like spoil it or anything but like experiencing that ending with the old face it was very like emotional so like when i replayed it recently on stream i i felt myself like sort of like teary eye and i was like man what the fuck like i knew this was gonna happen (laughs) but like you know just like seeing it happen and like with the inu face model that didn't happen for me again personally uh which i could see why some people complain about like you know it doesn't have like the same emotional impact but that's just because we have the old face model to sort of compare it to and our first experience with that so um i feel like by spider-man 2 people are going to be okay with this new face model because it's here to stay. So, you know, you sort of just have to suck it up at this point, but I'm, I'm pretty sure you didn't finish it, but like, what are your thoughts on Spider-Man remastered? Uh, yeah. I mean, basically everything I said about miles in terms of performance is like mm-hmm. stands with this. Like, you know, obviously all the same improvements miles has is what this remaster also has. Uh, again, it feels kind of hard to go back to the game without Venom powers, honestly. I'm just yeah. like, man, I just want to <laughs> Venom punch someone or cloak. It's going to be really hard to go back to Peter uh, in in whatever Spider-Man 2 is going to be. Uh, unless they give him, like, they're obviously going to give him more gadgets and stuff. But um, And in terms of Peter's face, like, I, whatever. Like, it's whatever to me. I'm like, it's mm-hmm. fine. Like, I, I never really got that upset about it either. Like, I'm just like, I, I don't know. But I think people were just hating it because it looked like Tom Holland and people hate Tom Holland Spider-Man. Like, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I, I guess that has to be like I know people just don't like it in general, but I don't know. I think it's fine. Like, was it necessary? Probably not. 
But it's also like it really isn't that big of a deal, you know. If the if you know, I still love the voice actor for Spider Man in, in these uh in uh, the Asarniac games, and that's really all that matters. That his face could be whatever; it doesn't really like matter. And you'll get used to it. He's gonna be in more games. You know, this new face is gonna be in more games than the old face. So uh, you'll definitely get used to it as being this Spider Man's face at this point. So mm-hmm. yeah. Uh, overall, I, th- I thought the remaster is really good. Uh, you know, obviously, if, if you have to get it, I'll say get it with the Ultimate Edition of Miles because I think standalone is like 40 bucks, which is like, I don't yeah. think that's worth it. <laughs> um, <laughs> I'll say just get the Ultimate Edition of Miles if you don't already have Spider-Man uh, on PS4 or if you just want the remaster, just get the uh, just get the Ultimate Edition. It's better that way. Um, but yeah, uh, pretty good because I love Spider-Man. <laughs> <So> yeah. <laughs> yeah, and like I said in one of our previous episodes, uh, Peter Parker is just another white boy, guys, but we'll move on from there. <laughs> uh, Tell Me Why is the next game that we are going to talk about. And yeah, I feel like Don't Nod finally came back into form when it came to their graphic adventure games uh, with the somewhat of a mishap, in our opinion, uh, for Life is Strange 2. I feel like that that game was all over the place, while this one really went back to sort of like a small town, sort of focusing on uh, these two uh, brother and sister sort of reconnecting after a long time being away from each other and going back to their hometown, sort of reliving that and sort of figuring out their past and what it all means um and yeah it was just great it was really 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 good um i would definitely put it at the bottom of a but i don't think i would put it any higher than that in my opinion uh but yeah what do you what do you think about tell me why since donad sort of came back to form if you will yeah i I honestly think this game was a better sequel to life is strange than life is strange 2 was you know Mm -hmm. i I think it captured the same feeling you know between two characters uh you know it it felt a lot more grounded uh, I, honestly, I, I ground it to a fault, I think, because I think the the main plot feels pretty mundane in terms of things. Like, obviously, like, mm-hmm. you know, I'm not going to spoil anything, but obviously, like, the main plot doesn't feel as grandiose as something like Life, Life is Strange 1 or 2. Uh, mm-hmm. But I honestly saw that as more of a positive thing. I know some people say online, like, it wasn't as exciting as those games, but it was still pretty good. But I don't know, I think having a more personal story that's more just based on these two characters and just seeing like their past and finally like coming to grips with it. I don't know. I, I just, I don't know. I just felt really attached to that idea of it. And you know, not everything has to be like this world ending event to be exciting. You know what I mean? You can have something that's mm-hmm. like more subtle and like more personal to these characters. Uh, you know, it might not be for everyone, but I definitely think it was, it definitely suits don't nods writing style more. I think. They tried to do whatever they were doing in Life is Strange 2 because I feel like they just tried to bite off too much in Life is Strange 2. Like they, they, there was too many locations, too many characters. You could never really settle with any of them. And this game, it goes back to Life is Strange 1 territory where it's like one town with like certain characters you meet throughout the, the three, I think it was only three episodes, yeah. The three episodes in this game. And I, I think that just works better for Don't Nod's like territory. Um, I'm just kind of worried because I know that the game they did after this, the, 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 uh, like the glass detective game i forgot what it was called mirrors something uh that game wasn't that yeah, good yeah twin mirrors or something yeah twin mirrors it wasn't as good apparently um so i hope they kind of focus more on this like smaller storytelling because i think it fits them the most and it really got me those life is strange one feelings again and that was all i was asking for because you know i think I-, I was hoping there wasn't like lightning in a bottle and i don't think it is i think uh don't not could really make these really good more personal stories if they just keep at it obviously they shouldn't like typecast themselves just to these type of games but um mm-hmm. and i commend them for really branching out to other like genres and stuff like where vampire was like rpg and stuff you know uh or just different genres in terms of storytelling but uh i think this is their bread and butter uh, bread and butter and where they really are feel the strongest at you know so yeah uh tell me why i think deserves that like low a tier spot because uh it was really good and i honestly haven't played a game like sort of like these like telltale style games like this in a while and it felt pretty good to like go back and like really like be invested in one again so yeah i, I really enjoyed tell me why yeah okay so once again i'm gonna All be right. talking about the yeah. last of us part two <laughs> yeah, yeah. for like the uh, time. fifth time yeah, yeah, yeah something like that um so i'm gonna put it at the top of b just sort of uh be consistent with like my top 10 video i do have fall guys below the last of us too just because uh, you know, this list is me and you, so, you know, yeah. uh, but anyways, Last of Us Part 2, uh, 
the game itself is not the dumpster fire that the gaming community claims it to be. Uh, the game itself is a bit of a mess, but there are some parts of it that I honestly really do like. For example, the technical aspect for this game on the PlayStation 4 is kind of mind-blowing. Naughty Dog is probably the one developer within like Sony's like PlayStation Worldwide Studios that truly took advantage of the PlayStation 4 to like its absolute limits. Um, for pretty close to like what insomniac games and what sucker punch did but like naughty dog is probably like the top 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 tier because uh every single time when the game goes from cutscene to gameplay extremely like you know like seamless and like uh spider-man does that ghost of tsushima does that in some ways but like naughty dog did that both times with uncharted 4 and the last of us 2 um and the technical aspect once again the rope i'm i'm, I'm gonna talk about the <laughs> rope every single time i can the rope man every single time i see that i'm just like man someone took the time to like code this like perfectly like i've never seen rope mechanics done this well um and like graphically the game looks stunning it looks really really good the music i think that uh this time around was done even better than part one i feel like that the music pieces that were used in the background for like certain cutscenes and certain moments within the game where you're were really really nice and honestly like set the mood a lot better i felt within this game than part one did um and then the gameplay like people will you know pretty much say like oh you know like part two's gameplay isn't all that great because it's pretty much like part one with just a few improvements but like the few improvements that they did add really made the game feel somewhat better so like the stealth tools that they added like the silencer going prone like all of that stuff is subtle but like it gives you more options to like do things within the actual like engagement so like you know if you throw a bow and arrow at someone you can go prone and like with the pistol silencer you can actually shoot someone without having to be detected because you decided to use some ammo uh the higher difficulty that they just inherently did because this is now a sequel more enemies less supplies the enemies are more aggro they're actually smarter that actually felt super rewarding to go through certain parts of gameplay because I was actually dying a lot because I was trying to play like it was part one because in part one, like honestly on normal, I could honestly get through the game just like blasting people because there were plenty of supplies around. But now there's like barely any supplies. There's more enemies. So you kind of have to like be smart and actually use the stealth tools that they now give you. Um, and the... The differentials between Abby and Ellie's gameplay is there just because they want to make sure that, you know, when you take control as Abby, there is something different with her in the gameplay department that you couldn't do as Ellie. So, like, the flamethrower stuff. Like, I, like it 100% would have been weird to see Ellie walk around with, like, a big-ass flamethrower. <laughs> you know, like, that just would have been weird compared to, like, in, in part one where you, when you did play as Ellie, you know, the things that you did as Joel fit with Joel. But now that you're playing as Abby, it is, you know, they sort of give that stuff from Joel to Abby sort of thing. Um, and the story, not going to spoil anything just in case if you don't know what happens in it. Uh, but the story is a mess. It is not paced all that well, in my opinion. I think that they might have, they probably had many different variations of how they wanted to tell this story. And I think that it was extremely ambitious for Neil Druckmann and everyone at Naughty Dog that worked on this story to sort of do it where... Uh, God damn, it's really hard to talk about the story without spoiling it. But um, if you know what happens, you know what happens. Like the things that they did, I was okay with. And then there were things that I wasn't okay with, with like pacing and stuff. If you want to know like more like, I guess like detailed, like more concrete thoughts, I'm going to plug my in defense of The Last of Us Part 2 video because I do defend the game in some aspects, but I do sort of dog it in, in others. Um, so yeah, that's why it's in B. It's not like, you know, completely dog, but it's also like not, you know, the perfect 10 out, 10 out of 10 game that like, you know, industry people claim it to be because it won so many game of the year awards and won a lot of other awards in general. Um, but yeah, last of us part two, um, I don't hate it, but I don't love it. I think that it is a fine game in terms of where it is. I think that making a sequel to the last of us one was very like, you know, like they, like they 100% knew that like making a sequel to that game was going to be dangerous and very risky and they went with it. So I, I'm going to give them props to like, you know, sort of go for it, you know, sort of want to continue the, the story of Ellie and sort of where it went. But I felt like that the story was a little long. 
uh, a little bit all over the place, not paced all that well. You know, maybe it, it could have been cut up differently. They probably did do that. And it was like, eh, it's probably not the best for like the player experience to sort of do it like that. So yeah, Last of Us Part 2 is going to be sitting at B on the higher end just because of just how the uh, list has panned out. Um, and now the next game I got here is Valorant. So Valorant is a game that is pretty much Riot's newest, most successful baby. So like Riot released Runeterra, they dished that shit to work <laughs> on Valorant, which is understandable because Valorant is being very, very successful as a game and also as an esport. Um, so I'm going to put it at the, all the way at the bottom of B just because I don't know if I'm going to continue playing it. I, I probably will continue playing it into next year, but I'm not sure for how long. Probably not as much as League just because I know that like I'm not good at Valorant. I just like playing it as like a fun game to play with my friends. Um, but the esports scene, I am very much invested into it. I love watching TSM. I love watching 100 Thieves. I love watching just like pro Valorant in general because it's very exciting and fun to watch. Uh, you know, it's, it, you know, when people describe Valorant, it is CSGO with abilities. Yeah. Um, and it's fun to watch, honestly, because it's like, all right, you, this guy has to shoot him. But like he's using like these different abilities, like shock darts or like smokes. And like, it's just it's just fun to watch. And like, I am very much invested in that scene now. Um, and Valorant as a game, like it works, it functions well. Uh, the latest map, Icebox, I am not the biggest fan of, but um, I know that they're probably working on other maps and sort of, you know, slowly expanding the game because, you know, they want to make sure that every single map sort of has a purpose and is playing differently from the other maps. Um, but yeah, and obviously new agents and all of that other stuff is fun to see. So, but yeah, overall, like Valorant, like I am very much casual with it just because I know that like I am not good at it and I'm not even going to bother trying to like solo queue or anything like that. Cause I know that like people are, people are just toxic assholes. Like at yeah. the end of the day, like people are just so rude. Like even when we play unrated with like one or two random people, like they'll like AFK or like troll or like do something stupid. And I'm just like, why are you, why are there people like this? You know, but at the end of the day, Valorant is still a fun tactical shooter with abilities, and I very much enjoy playing it casually. So, all right, last game we got here is Damien's Xenoblade Chronicles Remake, Remaster? Definitive, Definitive Edition. Edition. Yes. <laughs> all right, so, uh, yeah, so Xenoblade Chronicles Definitive Edition. Um, so, I, you know, I, I kind of want to give it an S, but after playing it again, I think it's like the top of A tier. And I could explain this. I mm -hmm. love Xenoblade Chronicles 1. Like, this plus Persona 4 really got me into JRPGs and really just made me want to expand to play more single-player games in general. Since this kind of came in a time where I was really only playing multiplayer stuff like League, TF2, StarCraft 2. Like, I wasn't really that focused on playing really that many single-player games. Until I saw the Chugga Conray Let's Play of Xenoblade Chronicles, I'm like, whoa, this game looks sick. And then I mm -hmm. bought it for myself and like just ended up loving it. Um... And playing through the remake, uh, yeah, playing through the remake again, I could definitely say it's still really good. Like, I think the story still holds up, the uh, the voice acting still holds up, everything still holds up. But I think, like, gameplay-wise, I think, um, you know, it's just, you know, the gameplay has been evolved from, you know, from Xenoblade X and Xenoblade Chronicles 2, where I think the gameplay is just better. And just the content in general. I think the side quests in Xenoblade 2 in particular, I just kind of blow this game out of the water, which is a good thing. Like, obviously, the, the, the series is evolving forward, not regressing. But going back to this game kind of felt a little harder to go back to since the combat almost feels a bit unfinished in this game. And that's not to this game's fault, obviously, because this is like the basis of what X and Xenoblade Chronicles 2 also uses. Um, but, you know, you could really only do so many things. You could chain attack, break and topple, and that's about it. Obviously, there's some there's more things, like there's some debuffs and things. But it's, it doesn't go as deep as, as X and 2 do, like with like different blade combos and all the other driver arts or whatever you could do in, in Xenoblade 2. Uh, that just makes that combat system way more engaging. And, like, the blade system, I think, also, is also really cool in Xenoblade 2. Um, and, you know, Xenoblade 1 is obviously lacking that because, again, it's, like, the first game that came out. Uh, so I don't want to knock it that hard because of that, but definitely kind of not taints my view of the first game, but definitely makes me appreciate, like, how the series is evolving forward, which, again, is a good thing, but kind of knocks this game down a little bit just because I, I don't think the gameplay is as good as X or 2. 
Um, but again, uh, everything else withstanding, I think all the new remix music they did is fantastic. The visuals are so much of an upgrade. Um, I think the Wii game, the visuals, like, sort of, like, the environments look fantastic. Like, every time you enter a new part of the Titan, uh, or, like, you know, Bionis and Mechanis look so good. Like, especially for a Wii game, I'm like, man, it's really impressive what they were able to do. But, um, a lot of the facial animations just look like garbage. Like, Shulk's face <laughs> in the original Wii game just looked really bad. As it was just, like, kind of just, like, a texture that was on there. And, like, it kind of moved a bit. It, it just didn't look good. I think the the more anime art style of this remake looks a lot better. I know some people aren't that happy about it. Because, oh, it looks too anime. But, like, come on. Like, it's an anime. <laughs> it's just a JRPG. Make it, it's an anime. Just, like, it's fine. Like, I know some people didn't like Xenoblade Chronicles 2 art style because it was super anime. But um, I don't know. I think it just works better, uh, better in general. Um, and the bonus content they added with um, Future Connected was really good. I think it added a great epilogue to the story, especially for one of my favorite characters, Melia. She gets like a really good like sort of send, well not send off, but sort of like a better ending than what she did in the original game, where I felt like she kind of got the sort short end of the stick of the happy endings in that game. Is all I'm going to say. So I'm mm-hmm. happy she was able to get like a good sort of epilogue in this game and the the sort of like combat system in that sort of new mode was pretty fun it's kind of the same but a little different there was some like differences in there um but yeah overall i i really loved it if you never played xenoblade chronicles before uh definitely a good start i think some people are kind of scared with xenoblade chronicles 2 because it's so anime like it really <laughs> is you know this this there's boobs everywhere there's like yeah you know the the dub is pretty it, it's good i love the dub in two but it's definitely like a little rough <laughs> rougher than one so I, I say if you want like a really solid jrpg that takes itself a little more seriously i think you can't go wrong with the first xenoblade chronicles just keep in mind i think the combat does get better in the future entries but it's definitely still a super solid game and i still love it a lot i just think it gets kind of overshadowed uh, overshadowed by its sequels so yeah still really good all right well i think that's everything we have to talk about about the best games of 2020 is there yeah. anything else you would like to add to this um no besides just saying that i think this year was a super good game a year for games like i honestly played mm-hmm. a lot and honestly I, I wouldn't have even played this many games if it wasn't for the quarantine period i'm gonna be honest yeah uh, mm-hmm. it came at the perfect time like like animal crossing doom persona 5 uh uh, Final Fantasy 7 and Xenoblade all came out at the same time and I was so happy because I'm like, I can actually play these games. So yeah, that's kind of why it was kind of stacked this year for me playing all these games. Um, mm-hmm. but yeah, overall, I think it was a fantastic year and yeah, as you can see in this list, there's not too many bad games that came out. So yeah. Yeah, that we played anyways. Yeah, that um, we, but I'm not going to play bad games, obviously. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, overall, I, I also think that this year for gaming, despite, you know, Cyberpunk and Last of Us 2, you know, those being like probably the most hype and most controversial games to come out uh for varying reasons you know yeah. um one was for story the other one was because it was a buggy mess <laughs> yeah uh, i think that there were still a lot of great games and a lot of great sort of pretty much every every one got a game this year that they probably like fell in love with i felt you know like if you're into like you know super massive multiplayer games you got fall guys or valorant or you know league of legends is obviously still going and probably a bunch of other multiplayer games that we didn't even talk about uh and you know rpgs single player games like there was just so much to do the and you, you even got a graphic adventure game would tell me why and like mm-hmm. they did such a good job with that game i forgot to mention that like the whole like lgbtq stuff that they implemented in that game was like pretty pretty top tier like they yeah. they they handled that with extreme care and i'm glad that they did that so um yeah and and it wasn't just like a you know it's not just there to like be there it actually serves the plot and story so um, but yeah, overall, this year for gaming was definitely pretty good. So I will I will also agree to that. So is that it? Yep, I think that's everything. All right. So thank you guys for listening to the last episode of the Travis and Damien podcast for 2020. We will see you guys next year with more episodes. See you guys.